Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to call to order the January joint meeting of several of our committees, the Finance, Capital Program, Bridges and Tunnels, Metro North Long Island Railroad, uh, and the New York City Transit Committee. Paige Graves, General Counsel, um, can you make a brief public announcement for the safety uh, announcement? Yes, good morning. As a part of today's joint committee meeting, there will be a single public comment session. We ask that members of the public adhere to the rules of conduct and the two-minute time allotment per individual. To ensure all registered speakers have the opportunity to provide testimony, the usual live recording option is also available. As Chair Lieber has stated, the MTA values input from the public and I encourage all those who have registered today to take advantage of the recording option available. All comments provided will be incorporated in the official record of today's meeting, posted on MTA's website, mta.info, and distributed to all board members. Further, board members are encouraged to view all public speaker testimony submitted as part of today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Paige. Uh, let's play the safety announcement and get going with the public comment period. Your safety is of the foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen and adhere to the following instructions. If you witness an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and call 911 immediately. Please follow any audible instructions provided through the public address system or visually on screens in the event of an emergency. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. If told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell B down the hallway past the elevators. If you have a mobility disability, or cannot self-evacuate, please proceed to stairwell D or E for assistance by MTA staff or emergency personnel. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. If you need assistance during an evacuation, please tell an MTA staff member or emergency personnel. Thank you and have a safe day. Okay, great. Uh, Megan, Melina, can we hear from our public speakers? Good morning. We have 14 members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we would ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind all speakers that in the interest of time and fairness, to so all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. Our first speaker this morning will be Jean Ryan, followed by Joseph Morales. I'm Jean Ryan, President of Disabled in Action of Metropolitan New York, DIA for short. On the MTA website, this meeting is classified under transparency, but quite a few people are concerned, baffled, and outraged that neither the MTA nor Accessoride has mentioned or told us about or shared the October 17, 2022 letter from the Department of Justice telling the MTA and Accessoride to clean up its act with the bad service Accessoride riders are getting. The DOJ said, and I quote, if we cannot secure a voluntary compliance agreement to resolve the violations, the Attorney General may bring an enforcement action in district court, unquote. Is there now a secret voluntary compliance agreement with DOJ? If there is, what is in it? Why is it secret? What changes is Accessoride making or planning? I can get up here and say things, but you are going to just say thank you, next, 
and ignore us and go on month after month and ignore that people are being left at the curb or picked up late or taken on long securitous rides, now you have to answer to someone else besides the activists. The same problems exist since excess rides started. One question, why is it seemingly okay for excess ride to outsource transportation for people with disabilities when you do not do that for buses and subways? Don't tell us it's because other entities do it or because it's too expensive to have drivers or workers work for NYCT. Those are just excuses. What we have with stress ride is what happens when you do not value people with disabilities and endlessly outsource our services. Please conclude Thank your you. remarks. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Joseph Morales, followed by Charlton D'Souza. I can begin? All right, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here to speak on a few issues. First of all, subway safety. Um, I've heard that the cops, I forget the exact name, cops something care, subway something care um, initiative has been working really well, and subway crime has dropped in recent months. However, um, one thing that I suggest for, in the future is that when we have group station managers already, you know, supervising cleanliness and other operations throughout our subway stations, you know, a lot of people have had differing views on you know, the amount of police there should be in the system. And I feel like each station and each community in our system is truly unique. So I feel like instead of trying to get police to the subway system from the city in mass, which has worked to a limited extent, we should empower these individuals to be able to go to their local precincts and community boards and say, we need more police here in this part of the station to do this. Because also our stations look very different. We have some stations on the IND lines with massive mezzanines where at night, um, things have happened, like at the 182nd, 183rd Street station last year, there was a robbery in one of those mezzanines. And I feel like with, you know, that different areas need to be approached differently. Also, um, I read in the agenda the topic of accessibility. Um, elevators are addressed, and that's a good thing. Um, but I feel like we need to think more about how we're addressing people with other disabilities, such as the visually impaired. The Navy Lens Go pilot on the M23, even though I'm not visually impaired, you know, I went there just to test the app in itself, and I feel like it, it could work really well. And I want us to, I know the MTA has been collecting feedback on that, and I want the MTA to be able to take that feedback and try and expand that, as well as other initiatives, as soon as possible. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is Charlton D'Souza, followed by Andy Quito. Good morning, everyone. My name is Charlton D'Souza, president of Passengers United. Unfortunately, we had another shooting um, on Saturday into Sunday. Uh, everyone's concerned about this shooting that happened um, on the Ennis and Nancy train overnight. Um, and, you know, the subways are not safe. Tell that to the 11 victims who died last year and the one victim who was murdered at 96th Street this year. Our subways are out of control and we need police in the subway. And, you know, we need the National Guard and we need state troopers in the subway. So I want to talk about the Jamaica bus terminal. You guys are planning to relocate it in front of the 103rd police precinct. And that's going to be voted on by the MTA board today. What was the MTA thinking? Why would they put an uh, active bus terminal in front of a police station. A criminal could escape from the precinct and escape into a city bus. And the police officers I spoke with at the police station have told me this is a bad idea, but even community residents have said the streets are so narrow. And I actually did a video on YouTube. I toured the station, uh, the uh, parking facility where the bus terminal is gonna be for three hours yesterday. And the streets are so narrow that it's going to be very hard to get buses in and out of there. And you guys need to not uh, approve this today. Please do not approve this Jamaica bus terminal project. I urge the board to please put this on hold. 
and have an independent audit, a traffic study, and an environmental assessment done. Because there was no environmental assessment, there's been no community meetings, nobody knows anything about this Jamaica bus terminal. The union doesn't know it, the drivers don't know, and nice bus. You guys need to work with Nassau and the County Express, and technically the MTE should come back, but that's another topic for another time. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is Andy Quito, followed by Murray Bowden. Good, good morning, guys. My name is Andy Quito, and I want to follow up about the Jamaica bus terminal too. Yeah, he is absolutely correct. The, the streets are so narrow, and you also got cars like blocking the, the sidewalk by around the one or third precinct. I know because I go there all the time, and it's not a good idea to put a bus terminal there across the one or third precinct because it's going to create a, a, a safety issue and why will you sell the land to a private developer to build more slum homes that's i don't understand that that's a this is still a perfect location even though it's a bad area it's still a perfect location for the bus to right across the queen's library put it in right in front of one third precinct is going to cause a traffic nightmare and you plan i think you're planning to use the two parking lots the one near the dmv where are people supposed to park and you guys are sticking onto to our nose, not notifying the 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 the, the residents of, of Jamaica Queens. If you want, you can, I'll, I'll take you guys on a tour, because you guys you can understand. Look, I don't need passengers United's help. Andy Transit Group will make this happen. All right, this is completely unacceptable. Please just put this on hold. Don't do not even approve this. If you approve this, it's going to be public outcry. All right. If any new station that's out here, please report report on this because this is a very very bad idea. Now let's get out onto subway safety. The situation is out of control, and like I said yesterday, I got a knife pull on me at the 14th Street Union Square after the tour of 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 Grand Central Madison. There's no safety done on the ground. Our elected officials have failed. Our 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 public advocates have failed. The advocacy group failed. Passengers united. Riders Alliance, why would you put on battle Riders Alliance? They're just paying you off. And finally, let's get to the good news about Grand Central Madison. It is very nice. It's very beautiful. And I give props to the MTA. Thank you so much for your time. I hope I can speak at the board meeting later today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Murray Bowden, followed by Kara Girl. <clears throat> when they were building the Tappan Zee Bridge, a barge broke loose and did some damage. Howard Milstein, who was uh, building the bridge at that time, said, find out who that specter was that should have been there and fire him. There are presidents of two units of this MTA that need to be fired. Bridges and tunnels, Long Island Railroad, and Metro North. It's a safety issue. The manual uniform traffic control devices is clear. They ignore it. This has been going on for years and years. Their documentation is in the files. I've documented it well. It is the responsibility of this board to replace immediately for safety reasons and cost factors the president of Bridges and Tunnels and the joint president of Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Safety counts. They're creating conditions that are completely unsafe because they don't follow the rule book. You've told me to follow the rule book. It's the responsibility of this board to fire those two people, replace them with somebody who's going to follow the law as currently written and has been written for years. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Kara Girl, followed by Marcel Dijon. Good morning. I'm Kara Girl, Research and Communications Associate at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. The opening of Grand Central Madison last week is an exciting symbol of a new, more unified future for the MTA. With the Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and subways under one roof, taking transit around the region and between the MTA's many modes is finally feasible. This is a game changer for people living in Westchester who need to reach JFK Airport, commuters who live on Long Island and work on the east side, Bronx residents who can now access more jobs in Queens and Long Island, and so many more people around the region. With ticket options like the combo ticket and city ticket, soon to be 24 seven, 
A more connected region is in sight, but better integration and coordination between the MTA's operating agencies would benefit riders even more. Freedom Ticket, with weekly tickets and optional transfers to subways and buses, would be even better. For, no for new users of Grand Central and Grand Central Madison, the long journey between transfers can be confusing. Continuing to add larger, clearer, and more colorful symbols and signs would help improve wayfinding. Another step towards a more connected region is better first and last mile options to help riders get to transit. We were pleased to submit recommendations for improving bike and pedestrian access to MTA facilities last year, many of which were included in the MTA strategic action plan released this month. The ongoing bus redesigns are also key to, ri to getting riders where they need to go, and we thank you for taking community input into account when the draft plans may not get everything right on the first shot. But better and more connected transit will only be a distant hope if the MTA can't avoid its looming fiscal cliff with dedicated operating revenue and continuing to build and maintain the system won't happen without getting congestion pricing over the finish line. We desperately need the governor and legislature to do their part to invest in transit and its millions of riders this budget cycle and hope that Mayor Adams will too, in addition to putting pressure on the state to keep the transit system that moves New Yorkers moving. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Marcel Dijon, followed by Jesse Figueroa. Hi. As you may have heard, the city recently acquired from CSX the former Putnam branch right of way through the Bronx, and they acquired that for the Tibbetts Brook Daylighting Project. This project would remove 5 million gallons per day of stream water from the sewer system, which currently flows into the sewer in Van Cortland Park, and it would create an ecological corridor between the Harlem River and Van Cortland Park. However, I was shocked to discover that due to the MTA's refusal to provide the section which it owns, which is south of 230th Street, both of those benefits are being greatly diminished. The brook would be put back into a pipe at 230th Street, eliminating any ecological connection, and it would be sent into the sewer system and going out through the outflow near 192nd Street, which is the only place that it can get under the uh, uh, the Hudson line. So the MTA uses this section of the, the Putnam branch to store some rusty old rail cars and uh, various pieces of uh, equipment. And uh, so why can't the MTA provide this section? If there's some essential function that needs to be done in this location that can't be re relocated to Highbridge or some other place along the Hudson line, why not identify the part that's actually being used, that's actually needed, and allow the remainder to be used for the ecological restoration? Uh, so I hope that you'll consider that, uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Jesse Figueroa, followed by David Kupferberg. Morning, everybody. I hope everybody had a happy and safe holiday season. Right now, I'm not in a best of mood today this after what i heard of grand central madison it was a lot of drama going on um um one minor a 17 year old was assaulted by an adult on that day and it broke my heart and other things have been going on there are still subway surfings going on especially on the williamsburg bridge that happened this past friday and also they have been complaints that I've been receiving that uh, children as 14 year, years old, I, I hang out with these nice children. They're all autistic. They have good grades in school and all that. And they've been um, verbally bullied by bus operators and other MTA personnel for nothing. And it's breaking my heart. Also, there's still homelessness going on on the system and I'm getting fed up about it. Um, and um and I wish there'll be more police presence at these stations that have mezzanines that are, like some couple of people mentioned, are too dangerous. Like West 4th Street, for example. And also, I was in Queens last night, and I'm against this Jamaica uh, bus terminal across the one of their precinct. As uh, Brother uh, Charlton D'Souza said, it's dangerous, not just that and all that stuff. I'm against it. And... and other than that, um, I'm glad to see you guys, and I will be looking forward to um, the MTA board meeting. Oh, yes, I have been also been hearing that people, these kids have been doing gang symbols on towards the holiday trains, like sticking the middle finger at it, and that is very atrocious. And I'll also bring that up at the regular board meeting. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is David Kupperberg, followed by Michael Ring. 
Good morning. Yes, the average bus speed in New York City is approximately 8 miles per hour. But consider that the average ge general traffic speed in New York City is approximately 10 miles per hour. Based on this logic, there should be no bus stops except at the terminals. Luckily for the MTA NYC DOT, I analyzed each and every bus stop within Brooklyn on a case-by-case -case basis. I have them on spreadsheets in a separate file. I make a similar conclusion as I did with the Queens Bus Network redesign draft plan. 95% of the bus stops in Brooklyn are good exactly where they are. In other words, the concept of bus stop spacing solely within New York City is wishful thinking and should not be practiced. The purist in me doesn't want BM 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5's Saturday service to be eliminated. But the realist in me knows that the MTA has the data to back up their intentions. The similar could be said about existing X28 weekend service and Seagate. But I also know that there is enough ridership during the weekday peak on the existing X28 and X38 to warrant Seagate service. It must not be eliminated. I gave every committee member my critique of the Brooklyn Bus Network redesign draft plan with related diagrams. Some ideas and concepts you would like and others not. Please read it with an open mind. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Michael Ring, followed by Christopher Greif. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Ring. Today I'm speaking on behalf of Disabled in Action. And uh, for those who need a visual description, I'm a white guy wearing a hoodie, and I need a shape today. Um, uh, well, the previous speaker spoke about buses and that they're not going very fast. Um, I want to speak about that, too. But first, I want to congratulate everyone in this room for doing some really complicated and expensive and generations of workers building these tunnels and new stations. But I, I'd like to suggest something that's simpler and, and will actually make money. Um, I live in Brooklyn, and I actually watch buses not get to the bus stop on a very regular basis. Um, that means a person with a disability may not be able to get on the bus or has to do some acrobatics to get on the bus. Um, and, but it also means that the traffic behind the bus has to come to a stop. So if the bus stop is after the intersection and the bus has to stop in the street, it means that the cars behind it are stopping in the intersection. I, I watch it happen just in my own neighborhood on 7th Avenue and Park Slope. That is what's happening all up and down 7th Avenue. If, if everyone in this room could work with the NYPD and the Department of Transportation to step up bus stop enforcement, parking, you know, it's not, they're not loading zones. They're not, they, you got to get the cars out of there. And you got to get the bus drivers to pull over to the curb. People with disabilities will get to use the bus, and traffic will move a lot smoother. Um, just to, throwing it out there to everyone in this room who has the power to, to make this happen. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is Christopher Greif, followed by Yuki Endo. Christopher, we can't hear you. Can you guys hear me now? We hear you now. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, Chris Christopher, we hear you now. You can start. Okay, thank you. First of all, good morning, everyone. This is Christopher D. Greif. One thing I definitely agree with Michael Ring, he's definitely correct. We definitely need to work together on that, and we need to, everyone to please attend the bus redesign. One thing I'd like to remind everyone regarding the finance, please make sure that reduced fare information is going in. Any meetings we have coming up in the future, we need to make sure the reduced fare price is there, as well as the Omni Weekly, Omni Monthly as well. But also very important is, at this time in need, we need to work together as all advocates together. We have to work together on this. We really need to work together to make sure that services on buses and trains, accessorized, everything is working together. We need to remind our elected officials, transportation is our blood, our soul, and we need to make sure it's running and the funding, it goes in for seniors and people with disabilities. And let's not forget the veterans and the baby strollers as well. The baby stroller is going really well, and I support that with all my heart and soul. And I hope we can still continue outreaching more. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you at the board live in person. 
Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is Yuki Endo, followed by Jason Anthony. Yeah. Uh, thank you for opening the Grand Central for Long Island data. Uh, please don't cut the fire from the Penn Station Grand Central for the post name and for Washington line. Uh, uh, because the weekday 526 fire I took the Mahasa was overcrowded. I did not support the uh, closure of the general bus signal because bus driver is less, less than the other passenger and the NK nice bus could be confused. I did not support uh, a Brooklyn bus never did the same or cutting the B14 or JK or cutting the B35 limited. A B2 bus need to be kept uh, because many people from the King's Bay. I uh, think we too, uh, since it's a uh, faster to get to uh, King's Highway weekly station. I do not support weekend service cut on the X27 or uh, 28, uh, B46, uh, B82 local, B60 need to be kept as it is. And I uh, thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Yolanda Ayani. Good morning, everybody. Jason Anthony here, starting the new year with Novato News. Last night, I received a, a text message with five images that this should be taken care of very, but very seriously. And we're talking about unauthorized people we're not, they're not supposed to be in. And wearing, guess what, MTA vest. Another issue, subway surfing. I happened to walk the Williamsburg Bridge. And also, this past Thursday, I was near Hunters Point Avenue, another point where these people do their thing, where it's completely illegal. But... I want to take this opportunity to wish a happy retirement to Greg Cipriano. We know that Greg has been a very nice person to all of us since his days in buses. And we wish him a happy retirement. And we're all going to miss him. And regarding Grand Central Madison, I wrote that first train with with our beloved CEO, John Lieber. I call him the man that gives us good surprises. But when I got there, a group of teenagers wanted to, to break the escalator. These people need to be caught and I'm willing to do a partnership with the MTA regarding this and other things. So I'll see you guys in the football later on this afternoon. Thank you for your remarks. Our final speaker this morning is Yolanda Ayani. Good morning. I'm talking about stress of ride. And it's most heart rendering to be stressed Go to the doctor and sit for three hours before someone can pick you up after you take chemo. You, you had a chemo. You need to be on your way home. When you call the, the broker services, everybody disappeared. Friday, I was on the phone for waited 22 minutes before somebody answered. This is ridiculous. When you look at your gas bill, go electric bill, your telephone bill, MTA, tax. What are we getting for this when we do stress a ride? Everybody, you go to the doctor's office, you say, oh, stress a ride is making me, they say, okay. You have to, even the doctor's office closing, you still sitting there waiting for somebody to come pick you up. This is ridiculous. What kind of service do we have? When are disabled people and seniors that use stress of ride going to get the same type of service that New York City Transit have when you take buses 
and you take the subway. Long Island Railroad, Metro North, when are prior transit people going to get that kind of respect? We are not respected at all. It's ridiculous. Why should we have to spend so much time waiting for people to get us from point A to point B? And we have to plan our life way ahead of time. Nobody, you guys get up in the morning and say, oh, I might go to this restaurant. And you can go. We can't. It's ridiculous. Enough is enough. We deserve the same respect as everybody else that used New York City Transit. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Chair Lieber, that concludes our public comment session for today. Uh, thank you to all the public speakers. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Board Member Zuckerman to begin the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and apologies for the abbreviated <clears throat> committee meeting. I think our Finance Committee is, uh, holds as one of its tenants transparency and uh, frequent discussions of financial issues, so we will keep this brief in the hopes of uh, not being here through the late hours tonight. Um, so uh, I don't need, know if I need to call the committee to order. My guess is we just get right into it, so we'll get right into it. So Kevin Willens will provide an update uh, primarily focused on Budget Watch. Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Neil. Um, just reporting quickly for January a little bit about the results for uh, last year on a full year basis. We're still working through finalizing expenses, so we'll report that out to uh, Finance Committee and the full board in February. But in terms of ridership, at least the way we look at it from a budget standpoint versus the McKinsey midpoint, we were pretty much right on the McKinsey midpoint for the full year 22, where we had projected 60.7% of uh, for total ridership and ended up at 60.3 percent for the for the full year fare box revenue we were higher because of higher average ticket price and slightly better on bridge and tunnel revenue now turning to talking about uh, revenues base versus the november plan Remember, the November plan was based on actuals through August and our forecast for the balance of the year. So versus that plan on uh, fare and toll revenue, we were $44 million better than plan, uh, which is 0.7%. On debt service, which we can report on, we were about $24 million or 0.8% lower than plan, so more favorable on dedicated taxes and fees and other subsidies, uh, kind of a mixed bag, state dedicated taxes and fees, 12.7 million better than planned. Real estate transaction taxes were down, we're uh, uh, negative one and a half percent or 21 million below, below plan. On the capital side, remember we get um, taxes in the mansion tax and two sales tax dedicated to the capital program for uh, versus the november plan the the uh we we're positive 29.22 million all in the uh the mansion tax so again we'll be uh, reporting in greater detail in february but um you know it's it was nice to see the uh, uh ridership and revenue um, pretty consistent to our plan um, finishing out the year. Yeah, I'm not sure nice is the right word, but uh, accurate, I think, is a, is a, is a better one. Uh, any right. board members or committee members, any questions on Budget Watch, please? All right, Harry. Uh, just uh, if you can comment a little bit on the real estate transactions. Are they below what we budgeted, or uh, is it just that there's been a dip in the market because of the mortgage rates? So b below versus our forecast, mainly in the mortgage recording tax area, which is going to be, you know, in the region when there's lower refinancing activity due to higher rates, we see it come down. So it's kind of a mixed bag on real estate. The, uh, the um, property transfer tax was higher, but the mortgage recording tax was lower, probably the transfer tax because the sales, you know, as, as you know, prices have, have gone up a lot and we get a get a percentage of that. So we're going to watch it closely because, as, as you know, it's a it's a big but volatile part of our revenue stream. 
Other questions? All right, hearing none, Pat, the floor is yours. Finance Watch, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to do a, a short abbreviated finance watch this morning. Uh, the first thing to report is that in the month of January, we had two transactions. The first was a PMT, a payroll mobility tax issuance, uh, to refund seven series of transportation revenue bonds and one series of dedicated tax fund bonds. That refunding resulted in uh, $61 million of net present value savings. And then just last week, we issued uh, TBTA, senior level uh, refunding bonds to refund outstanding uh, TBTA general revenue as well as subordinate revenue bonds and that transaction will close uh, later this week. And then lastly we have a fuel hedge that executed on December 28th 2.8 million gallons of ULSD at a locked in price of $2.70 per gallon. That concludes Finance Watch. Well, Pat, that may conclude Finance Watch, but it also concludes your tenure in that seat yes, uh, in front of this board, and I want to thank you for your many years. I've been in this board eight-plus years, and uh, your steady voice and steady hand on managing uh, our cost base when it comes to issuing debt has been a source of comfort to me and I think the general public. So people don't appreciate the importance, but given the size of our debt and the steadiness required for that, we've very, been very lucky to have you at the seat. So thank you, Pat, for your years of service. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have a very important topic, which is to approve a work plan for the upcoming year. The draft work plan's on page 11 of your committee book. I believe it's in a fair state for what we need to accomplish in the next year, and I'd like a motion to uh, approve that work plan. Can I, have a, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Sharif. Any discussion, edits, deletions, corrections? All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, motion passes. Our work plan is approved. Uh, we have no procurements this month, and the real estate action items will be presented later at the board meeting. That concludes the business of the Finance Committee. Mr. Chair, I return it to you for the capital program. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Uh, capital program procurements will be presented at the board meeting this afternoon. Um, and... I'll call on board member Mack to lead us through bridges and tunnels, if I'm, no? Capital program president. Oh, yeah. Ka Jamie, all right. Jamie. I am, I'm completely bollocked up. <laughs> the point was for me to uh, introduce Jamie. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Jamie Torres Springer, president MTA CND. Thank you, chair. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to recover here. Um, I too am a little thrown off. I, I, um, uh, I'm excited to, uh, to uh, you know, make a series of presentations to the board this month on the status of our capital projects. I do have a presentation um, to, uh, to get us going. Um, so I'm sure it's being... Okay, great. So this month uh, at the Capital uh, Program Committee, we're reviewing our integrated expansion projects. Um, I, uh, I do want to take a moment to welcome, uh, we have a new head of uh, the Office of Construction Oversight, Lou Diera. Uh, I'm not sure if he's here. I think we're running a little early, so he may not have made it up here, but uh, members of the uh, Capital Program Committee will get to know him over the coming months and years, I'm sure. Uh, of course, this was a banner month uh, for the MTA and for construction and development as we opened Grand Central Madison. Oh, sorry about that a long-delayed project that will combine with other improvements uh, that we've successfully made in the meantime, such as third track and the regional improvements at Harold Interlocking, increase service by 40% into Midtown and save the average east of Penn commuter 40 minutes. The opening was great. The chair will um, have a full report on that uh, and some highlights at the full board meeting this morning. Uh, but I do want to thank all of our partners, particularly from the Long Island Railroad and our partners from the Federal uh, Trans Transportation Agency uh, Authority, um, uh, who uh, were constant in their support and partnership uh, throughout the project, and it was good to have them at the opening. I want to also acknowledge Rob Troop, who was our project executive for the last few years, uh, since uh, Chair Lieber and others um, really uh, um, restructured the project in 2018 and set it up for timely completion. 
Um, and Rob uh, lived and breathed this project 24-7 uh, for those years, particularly the last couple of months, which were very, very challenging uh, as the completion of any uh, major new infrastructure project can be. Um, but uh, we learned many lessons from this project and uh, have applied those to other programs and projects as, as we'll continue to share with the board uh, over the coming months. Penn Station with its 600,000 daily riders is the next one on our list. We've already made great progress with the gateway entrance on 7th Avenue and 33rd Street. Um, that, uh, that really creates an entry point um, and an awareness of the location of the station. Uh, and now the 33rd Street Concourse is coming along on time and on budget with a collaborative design-build approach that is the model for future work that we do at Penn Station in the full reconstruction, the other 80% of the station beyond that concourse. Uh, and we're hoping to come to an agreement with our two railroad partners on uh, proceeding with that project soon. Um, you've heard us describe the benefits of the new Long Island Railroad concourse over uh, the last few months. I, I did want to give you a sampling of some of the feedback that we're getting from customers. May need to restart this with volume. Members of the board can just get a sense of the body language of the folks that we've, <laughs> we've interviewed, how successful the new concourse is. It's beautiful. We, we got go. right out and it was open and just like crash. You used to be so proud and you couldn't find where you were going yet. It has improved significantly. You know, it looks a lot better than it looked before. Amazing. It's gorgeous. It's going to be great for, you know, people from out of town. Even on my on that Long Island. The entrance is beautiful. It's nice and spacious. Looks fantastic. It was very dark before. And seeing all the, the ambient light and everything, like it brings a nice touch. It's like breathable. It's more breathable yeah, here. Yeah, it's like it's going to be magnificent. You know, it shows that you know the MTA is caring about the the station and the upkeep. You know, so the people feel more comfortable. You know, using the train. So as we note there, we have, um, we have opened the, uh, the new concourse, doubling the height and the width. Um, that got done before the end of last year, and we have substantial completion of that project scheduled for March of 2023. And then it's on to pen reconstruction and really um, the, you know, the concept of making uh, the entirety of Penn Station, as I say, the other 80 percent, um, really um, – uh, you know, substantially more open and spacious uh, and great opportunity to serve those 600,000 daily riders. As we approach substantial completion in March, customers will see even more benefits. Last week, we opened the new entrance across 33rd Street with a new ADA elevator, complete with a texting function for hearing impaired, impaired riders that will be the model for future improvements in the system. This is just the latest accessibility improvement in addition to four elevator replacements that have been part of that concourse project. Uh, we move on to uh, some of the upcoming projects uh, and uh, note to the board that the, this month the governor announced we are proceeding with next steps on the Interborough Express in the lead up to the next capital program where we believe it will be a strong candidate for a new light rail line that will connect to 17 subway lines across Brooklyn and Queens. Please do stay tuned for the board meeting where we'll talk about uh, a, a year in review for C&D, including the numbers that we achieved over the last year. Uh, we'll also be uh, putting out a strategy document um, uh, outlining what the future of uh, MTA construction and development looks like uh, later this week. And uh, I am joined by Tom McGinnis, our project executive for uh, Metro North Penn Station Access. Just in time, Tom. Um, we want to give the committee a full status update today on Metro North Penn Station access. As you'll hear, since the last report to the committee, we've made a lot of progress on this project, including holding a groundbreaking with the governor and nearing completion of design. 
The city also announced land use plans for Morris Park and Park Chester Van Ness <coughs> station areas, and we're working closely together with them. This is an exciting opportunity to capture some of the transit-oriented development value that gets created by the extension of this new line uh, to four stations in the Bronx. Um, and we're pleased that the city administration is really looking at it that way as well. And uh, as I said, working very closely together. Unfortunately, as Tom will share, we haven't yet made the construction progress we were scheduled to make. And at present, the project is potentially behind schedule. This is due to challenges working with the other railroads that use portions of the Hellgate line, particularly Amtrak, which has been unable to provide the agreed upon weekend outages uh, in some cases, and more often the force account support, meaning the fla flaggers, track supervi uh, su supervisors, uh, the electrical traction linemen that we need to work on or adjacent to their property. The board is aware this has been a longstanding problem, and you've heard about it a lot, particularly in uh, Herald Interlocking uh, in Sunnyside Yard, which was fully reconstructed as part of Eastside Access, but which has cost us hundreds of millions of dollars over the budget due to difficulties getting support from Amtrak. Fortunately, with Penn Access, Metro North Penn Station Access, given this experience, we negotiated an agreement in advance for Amtrak to provide a fixed number of outages and a certain amount of dedicated forces. They have been unable to live up to this agreement to date, and we have ensured that they have been on notice of that. And uh, the good news is that Amtrak acknowledges these problems, and in part, due to that strong agreement that we negotiated with them, they're working collaboratively with us on a recovery schedule. The main feature of that recovery schedule is a long-term outage, as much as eight months that they will give us starting in March so we can catch up on work and do so with much less required support from Amtrak while we're doing it, uh, since we'll have the long-term outage. We're counting on Amtrak to live up to this agreement and to this commitment for the long-term outage. With that, I'll pass it to Tom McGinnis. Thank you, Jamie. I'm pleased to report to the committee this morning on the Metro North Penn Station Access Project for the first time since work has started. Oh, sorry. The board approved this project in December 2021 and notice to proceed was issued to the design builder, which is a joint venture consisting of Halmar International and Railworks. The project will provide Metro North Rail service to and from Penn Station. Four new passenger stations will be constructed in the Bronx, at Hunts Point, Park Chester, Morris Park, and Co-op City, which will reduce commuting times to Midtown by as much as 50 minutes. As shown on the map, the project will benefit communities not only in the East Bronx, but also those along the New Haven line in both Westchester County and Connecticut by providing direct access to Manhattan's west side. The majority of the work will focus on a six mile section of the existing Hellgate line, which is owned by Amtrak. Highlights include replacing existing two track alignment and constructing four new tracks. In total, 19 miles of new track and over 200 overhead catenary structures will be installed. We will replace or add eight new power substations, four bridges carrying railroads. will also be rehabilitated or replaced to accommodate the additional width. This past December, we're honored to have Governor Hochul, Senator Schumer, and other elected officials attend a formal groundbreaking ceremony at the site of the future Park Chester Station. This was followed with a press event at Hunts Point with the message that MTA is connecting communities by expanding transit in the Bronx. <clears throat> the project budget is $2.8 billion, which includes an option awarded this past December to expand the Metro North New Rochelle Yard. And I'll discuss the schedule in more detail when I present project risks. Today, much advanced work has been completed, including simultaneously progressing 45 complex design packages, with a number of them already reaching 100% and ready for construction, and the remainder to finish in 2013. The contractor has mobilized and has begun performing work to support design activities, which include survey, geotechnical borings, and test pits. Work has also included clearing the site, relocating utilities, and constructing access roads. The Leggett crossover, which has been identified early as a key component to improving operational flexibility, 
that increasing opportunities to access the right-of-way has been procured, fabricated, and delivered to the project site. Installation of this key interlocking will begin in 2023. The design builder has also been performing work that does not require access to the right-of-way, such as bridge substructure rehabilitation. The photo on the left is crews installing tiebacks to strengthen one of the existing bridge abutments. Work to be progressed, progressed in 2023 includes bringing the existing overhead catenary clearance into compliance in order to shift freight traffic onto the existing passenger rails. Installation of a temporary CSX switch, installation of overhead catenary structures, which will be key to the future phasing of the project, retaining wall construction, the start of track installation and drainage work, some substations and work at the Hunts Point and Park Schechter stations are also expected to begin by late 2023. Excuse me. Before you uh, change the slide, you may want to correct the one on the left so it says Bronx, New York instead of New York, New York. It's a noted point. Thank you. <clears throat> Some of the key project risks the project team is working to mitigate several risks, including coordination with third party stakeholders. New York State DOT has four significant construction projects in the area adjacent to or over the Hellgate line that have potential to impact the project. Environmental permits are being obtained from regulatory agencies. And we're also working with Con Edison to finalize details for the supply of service feeders to elements such as the future substations, stations, and interlockings. Property acquisitions and easements were identified very early as a project risk. The project team has been working closely with MTA Real Estate throughout this acquisition process, and at this time, wall acquisitions remain on schedule. The largest risk for the project remains coordination with the existing operating railroads, in particular Amtrak and CSX. To take advantage of lessons learned from Eastside Access and Harold, we entered into an agreement with Amtrak at the start of this project where Amtrak committed to providing track access and force account staffing to keep the project on schedule. As Jamie mentioned, Amtrak has not provided the access or resources as a result, and as a result, after just one year, the project is potentially six to nine months behind schedule. We're currently performing a time impact analysis against the original baseline schedule to determine the impacts. The MTA sent notice to Amtrak, pointing out that to date they have not met their commitments in the agreement. Amtrak has responded reaffirming their intention to support the project and has offered opportunities to the project that may mitigate past delays. Based on this, we have been working closely with Amtrak and the design builder to develop a scheduled recovery plan and have already implemented a number of actions. There's a lot of work ahead of us. But if we are successful and Amtrak provides the access and support that is needed, the project team believes the delays experienced to date can be mitigated to bring the project back to the original schedule for completion in 2027. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions, final remarks from the IEC. Mr. DeVito for the IEC. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Before I begin my comments on the Metro North Penn Station access and the Penn Station Concourse project, the IC would like to congratulate the MTA, its Grand Central Madison project team, and the Long Island Railroad on achieving revenue service on January 25th within the current $11.1 .1 billion budget. On the Metro North Penn Station access project, with respect to schedule, notice to proceed was issued on, in January of 2022 for the base contract and December for the option work, which includes new Rochelle Yard improvements. Substantial completion is planned for March of 2027. At the 12-month mark, the design packages continue to be advanced and construction activities such as procurement and delivery of long lead track components, utility work, and supportive excavation on two of the four bridges in this project have commenced. However, the most recent contractor schedule update reflects a delay of seven months, and while several issues contributed, the delay was primarily due, as mentioned, to a lack of Amtrak force account support, as well as CSX's inability to support the planned track outages. The project team, which se seeks to recover this time, is pushing back on the contractor and is working with Amtrak and CSX on a revised detailed plan in which they have agreed to extended track outages and the necessary force account resources for the planned work. 
if this construction project is to overcome delays while maintaining both passenger and freight service on this line, these are vital. Regarding this budget, both the project's budget and estimated completion remains at $2.867 billion, and the IEC agrees with these numbers. The top project risks driven by external stakeholders are as follows. Based on an MOU with the MTA, Amtrak is required to provide sufficient resources required for the successful completion of the project. Amtrak has been challenged in providing the support to date, and there is risk that this can continue. CSX attendant railroad to Amtrak <coughs> signed a maintenance agreement in May of 2022. The timely execution of this agreement allows stakeholder, all stakeholders to work closely to provide track, access to tracks when needed. CSX has granted short-term track outages, but longer-term outages could significantly improve construction work productivity. There is risk of delay in obtaining the needed regulatory permits from agency stakeholders such as the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Coast Guard, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and New York City Parks Department for the construction work adjacent to wetlands and waterways. The IEC notes that while construction is in early stages, plan mitigation actions, <coughs> if acted upon swiftly, may effectively address these risks and aid in the reduction of the delay the project has experienced to date. And that concludes my remarks on Metro North Penn Station access. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'm going to weigh in here. So last week we finished the biggest construction development project in MTA history. And, and I was asked at the press conference, what did you learn? And I said, use design build. Don't crush, you know, balkanize a project into all sep these separate little contracts that run into each other. Have a detailed extremely detailed schedule like the one we used to change the trajectory of Eastside Access, now known as Grand Central Madison, five years ago. Um, and have commitments on outages so you can work on the railroad and get the work done that you that is part of the project. So this project is a design-build project. It's got a tremendously detailed schedule. It's being run by a first-class team, Tom McGinnis, in case anybody doesn't know, ran third track, which is the model of a mega project for the MTA, on time, $100 million under budget. And the missing ingredient is the outages and the support from our sister railroad, who owns the railroad, Amtrak. This is the dynamic that got Eastside Access into the hole. There's probably a billion dollars of extra costs in Eastside Access, maybe more, from the problems that that project had. And this is all long before any of us, with the exception of one member of the board, were here. Um, but the problems of Eastside Access, a lot of them stemmed from the fact that we, that we were required to rebuild all of Harold Interlocking, the biggest railroad intersection in the United States, eight or 900 trains a day, and we couldn't get the time to work on the track, right? Right, Vinny? Yes, sir. Couldn't get the time to work on the track, couldn't get the, the, the support. Now, what do we do? And we learned from, we, the lesson we learned was we must have it, so we required Amtrak, unlike Eastside Access, where they had no uh, liquidated damages or penalties or downside risk or skin in the game, we required them to make an agreement offer to, to, to commit to provide the access and the, the, the people, the flaggers and the supervisors and the electric traction power professionals. So now what do we have? We have delay. We have a repeat of that Harold interlocking dynamic. But we have legal rights. I don't want to write, when none of us wants to exercise them. Amtrak is our partner, and in, in fairness, they have been trying to improve why do they have to improve? It's not just for us. They got Gateway. They got a $60 billion program on the Northeast Carter that they want to accomplish, but they are still struggling to uh, get people and capacity to support work, even just our relatively small East, uh, Penn Access project. So this is an important dynamic, and I you know, urge the board. We. We, we, we set new MTA standard with third track. We corrected the trajectory of Eastside access, which, you know, basically uh, 
was in trouble for many, many years. And we're using all those lessons on this. This is the mega project that we're engaged in right now, uh, Pan Access. And it is the linchpin of the plan to create a truly integrated regional railroad system, right? Because now we have uh, Grand Central Madison, Long Island Railroad customers, a substantial chunk of them are going to the east side. That opens us up room. And, by the way, Metro North customers are coming, thanks to this project, to Penn Station in a few short years. What do we have to get done in the meantime? We have to fix Penn Station. You saw Jamie talking about what's been done in the concourse. If you haven't seen it, please, board members, go to the Penn Station concourse. Well, you know, shame on us if we haven't run a, a, a tour for board members. It's like 20% of Penn Station actually looks like a modern transportation facility. If you like do, if you block, you know, put blinders on, you'd think you were in something a little more like the new LaGuardia. But of course, when the blinders come off, you turn your head, it's the same old dump that was bequeathed to us by our, our transportation forefathers and mothers, I suppose, in the, in the 60s, right? That facility that says, we don't value mass transit. We don't value commuters who don't drive. So this is, this is it. We got to get in there and start work on that Penn reconstruction project now, because the window is between now and when Penn Access finishes in 2027. It's a short window to tear apart Penn Station, existing Penn Station, and get the big structural work done so we can start, we can have a normal place when our Metro North customers, Blanca, come into Penn Station, right? So this is a huge linchpin of the next few years. Can we make all these moving parts work? Now, Governor Hochul has really made to her credit, when she came in, she came and she started saying, we want to do pen reconstruction. Gateway is hugely important. By the way, does anyone notice that we have our gateway for the East River? It's called Grand Central Madison, a project that gives us a second way across the river, a project that protects us in the event of, God forbid, a transportation emergency. And you know what? $11 billion, a lot of money, too much. But just compare the cost to Gateway, right? You know, the Gateway numbers you're hearing about don't even include the terminal. We got the project plus the terminal uh, for all rolled into that project cost. So we got our Gateway. Now we need to fix the other side of the equation so Metro North and everybody else in Penn has a good place. So I invite the board to comment on, on any of these elements of my rant. Um, but it is, I just want to focus us on, this is the challenge of the next couple of years, along with, need I say, funding the MTA, getting congestion pricing done, delivering all aspects of the capital program, keeping our progress towards a fully accessible system and so on. But this is, from a mega project standpoint, the linchpin. Mr. Albert. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, since I'll ask the one that you just raised. The improvements to Penn Station, how much of those depend on the big, giant Penn Station redevelopment versus what we're doing in there now? It, it, it may, assuming I understand you correctly, what we're doing in there now, we're basically done. It's just that concourse and that new entry onto 7th right. Avenue, right. which is creating some visual identity for Penn Station in the streetscape. Otherwise, you continue where, in the situation where people wander around 7th Avenue asking random people, where is Penn Station, the biggest transportation facility in North America? Right, Jerry? That's the yeah. way it feels now. But we put in that escalator bank that really creates a visual identity and an anchor yeah. for Penn. All right, but that is, that, that's the project that we're basically finished with. Jolien Handler standing right there, got it done on time, $100 million under budget. Now we're waiting for the agreements to fall into place so we can start the design, which is not yet underway, because we're, we're still, as we say in Brooklyn, hopping with uh, Amtrak and New Jersey Transit about the process. And 
construction, so we got to get it going. We're going to run out of time. All right. And my second question, Jamie, you mentioned that Amtrak has agreed to an eight-month suspension of something. Exactly what is that something? Um, so, um, right. Um, just to, to this point, I would just back up to say, you know, and agreed, the, it's very important that we have this agreement in place. It allows us to exercise our rights in this case. Um, I will say, I think Tom said it, that um, the, it's, it's the real shortage of forces to support work that is the problem for Amtrak, and they acknowledge that. Um, they have, in the last few months, stepped up and provided us with uh, improved project management partners to deal with, uh, uh, co-occupying co space with Tom up in New Rochelle in the field office, and agreed to a long-term outage uh, of, uh, it'll be, uh, there's two tracks there, so there'll be a long-term outage of one track at a time for the, the period that, um, that is required. We're, we're working together to make sure that we lock down that outage. Of course, that allows us to use other means other than force account, uh, physical barriers in some cases, to be able to protect the track, but it's not the cure-all. Um, we still that, need support. Is that outage going to affect their service? Uh, I think that they have been planning hard uh, and working with our colleagues at Metro North to make sure that uh, they're, they're able to manage around it. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Zuckerman, then Ms. Lopez. Ms. 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 Lopez. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you, Chair. Um, just for a point of clarification so that I'm understanding this, for Metro North riders, they take the New Haven line. They it stops from Penn Station, it stops in New Rochelle, and then they would have to transfer to an, to another local bound train if they're going further north. So the, it, 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 there's, there's always a stop in New Rochelle, big, big, Abs yes. Richmond, but the, but there will be some trains that, that can t that go from New Rochelle, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the Hellgate line through the East Bronx into Penn. So, Ultimately, it'll be a little bit like the experience at Jamaica, where you could get on a Grand Central train or a Penn train. Um, it may be, depending on whether we have, you know, the yard capacity and other variables, it may be, and Jamie, maybe you guys could step in here, but it may be initially that you're transferring, but there may, in the long run, there's going to be trains that go to Grand Central and some go to Penn on the New Haven line. Tom? Mr. Chairman, you're correct. I believe Metro North is still working on the specific details of their operations for this, but it, it appears that there will be trains that do start at New Rochelle that run specifically to Penn Station, but there may be opportunities for other trains to pass through, stopping at New Rochelle and continuing. Kathy, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, th that's about right. I mean, I think that there is some, ex some expectation that, uh, you know, a lot of the trains are going to be running back and forth from New Rochelle, but they're, you know, we're still looking through the opportunity for some service out from New Rochelle into Connecticut, so that that's still under under development. Mr. Zuckerman. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, the Bronx is the borough of my birth, so I am uh, impressed by this program. I've always been supportive of it. Uh, that it creates truly new access is undeniably impressive that is about equity and revolutionizing neighborhoods. It's extraordinary. Uh, however, being on the board a long time and everything you said that since you're joining the board with Eastside Access is quite impressive. It's, uh, it's numbers before you joined versus where we ended up are very different. So can you just for the purposes of putting numbers in our head, which is always dangerous, can you remind us the budget and the date of delivery that's currently expected? Because I, I just, I gotta put a number in my head and maybe I'll add a third request, which is at some point, I know it's very early, but I'd love to know what we think the incremental operating expense is going to be at some future date when we're in revenue service. That, that you can hold uh, off. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to give you an IOU on that one. Yeah, but, of course. Uh, Jamie, on, uh, on the uh, budget and the schedule. The total budget for Metro North Penn Station access is $2.8 billion, including all contingency. Um, that's the third-party contract as well as the uh, in-house budget. Uh, the schedule is for completion uh, in 2027. And, and again, I, you know, I would emphasize that, uh, as the chair often does, that um, that's why it's critical that we get moving on the reconstruction of Penn Station. Um, I think my, my colleague um, uh, Q the other day um, uh, said at an event uh, that while others are rethinking uh, Penn Station, we're rebuilding Penn Station, and uh, we're intent on continuing to do so. Um, 
And so we need to do that because, uh, you know, from three weeks from now, when a uh, significant amount of Long Island Railroad service begins to come into Grand Central instead of Penn Station, and 2027, when provided we uh, write the schedule on this project in partnership with uh, the other railroads, um, we will be bringing a Metro North Penn Station access into Penn. We have that opportunity, that critical opportunity of uh, reduced train congestion to rebuild the infrastructure in Penn. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Solomon? Just a quick question on the parkland alienation. Um, you know how many parcels of land that will be, that will need to be alienated and whether the legislation will be pursued this legislative session? I don't have the total number in front of me right now. I be, believe a number of those parcels we've already gone through with legislation for and just a few remaining at this time. And, and just a point of clarification, there's, there's a special provision that passed the legislature a couple of years ago at our request dealing with real estate acquisitions on this, relevant to this project to try to make sure that it did not delay the, uh, the project, although people will you know, debate value and, and you know, eminent domain process, but we want to make sure it didn't delay this project, so we actually got the legislature to pass a special law. I'm going to end this conversation by saying we really need to put together a, a tour of the concourse and existing pen for the board. Just make sure people understand how this, as this debate unfolds, what, what's been done, what hasn't been done. When you ride up that escalator, um, which I'm so proud of, and come out on 7th Avenue, you have a view of the Empire State Building. Um, I'll make sure that when the board comes, it's not uh, lighted in green. Um, <laughs> Um, in honor of a Philadelphia football team, we have a, we have a, uh, could be the Jets, <laughs> Paige is an optimist. Um, we have a lighting feature in that entrance, it will, it will, it will not be going to, won't, will not be used for uh, celebrating other cities' football teams. Um, all right, any other comments or questions? Is there some more routine business that you need to do with the work plan, uh, Jamie? Not to my knowledge, Chair. Okay. All right. This is one of those choreography moments. Uh, I'm sorry? You should approve the work plan minutes. Yeah. Is, the, is there, there's a work plan in the book, correct? Okay. Yes, there uh, is. Are there any comments or uh, corrections to the work plan, Jamie? No? No. Okay. No change to the work plan. All right. And Actually, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. Um, there is a change to the work plan. There was a um, security update that was scheduled for this month that we'll be deferring to April in order to uh, provide it to the board in coordination with a report out from the new systems business unit. Um, okay. And is there and there were minutes distributed of the last committee meeting. Are there any comments or corrections? Let's see, Mr. Albert is calm and not indicating so uh, in the absence of any comments or corrections we'll deem those approved I just want to before we close capital program Mr. Troop still here he stepped out Mr. Troop Rob Troop Rob Troop in the back of the room is the man who took over Grand Central Madison um, is not I could go on a long time but I'm just going to skip it and say that he's now got uh, several uh, major line openings in the United States under his belt um, including this last one which is about as big as it gets uh, amazing amazing work Rob came in uh, in 2018 and helped me to figure out how to restructure that project um, which he and Jamie then brought in uh, to port um, and then um, he agreed to come aboard, although uh, he was safely ensconced in another more comfortable position. So come aboard and, and lead the project. So we're, we are all incredibly indebted. New York is indebted to you, Rob, so thank you. All right, with that, I'll revert to the agenda. And Mr. M well, Mr. Mack, uh, can we ask you to take us through the Bridges and Tunnels Committee? Yes, uh, <clears throat> good morning. <clears throat> uh, I'd like uh, to get an approval for the minutes. 
the last meeting. Uh, Do you have a motion? Yeah. Second. Fine. Yep. <clears throat> we'll move it. Yeah. You had a motion? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any questions on it? Great. Uh, all in favor, sir. All in favor, aye. Uh, uh, I like, uh, 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 well, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Uh, uh, Chair, <clears throat> B&T proposes 2023 work plan starts on page 10 of the committee book, and we yeah. are requesting a committee approval. Yeah, okay. So we can uh, have a motion for 2023's approval from B&T committee members? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> any questions on uh, the motion or the work plan? <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Uh, uh, no questions. I uh, turn it over to uh, the, our president for his uh, remarks. Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mack. Um, you're going to get a lot of me today. I'm going to run through the full B&T committee, so sorry uh, for not throwing it to other people. Um, good morning and welcome to the January 2023 MTA Bridges and Tunnels Committee meeting. I would like to start this first B&T meeting of 2023 by briefly mentioning that overall 2022 numbers indicate potential records for traffic volume and certainly for revenue stream, which is good news for reinvesting in our bridges and tunnels as well as critical support to mass transit. Next month, I hope to share finalized numbers on that. And we will also present our annual customer environment report delivered by my vice president of maintenance, Charles Passarella. This report provides 2022 metrics on key customer service areas such as travel time, safety, uh, roadway conditions, basically anything customer facing at our facilities. Also next month, we will provide an overview of open road tolling as we mark the five year anniversary of B&T's conversion to ORT last year. So we completed that in 2017 the, uh, in October and we had five full years of open road tolling already. It was like yesterday. I'm pleased to say that we've continued the ORT momentum by building on customer environmental improvements such as reduced congestion, improved traffic throughput, benefits shared by B&T customers, including the MTA and New York City Transit bus customers. But again, more on that in February. Right on cue. So if you look at this chart, um, you know, that being said, I wanted to share a preview to show where we were before ORT to help understand the significance of where we are now. So we constantly talk in our B&T committee meeting of, you know, we look at our safety metrics, specifically in this, we're looking at the, the traffic trends. So uh, looking at where we were, so you see the, as traffic increased through 2015 through 2017, we saw an increase uh, in collisions with the traffic increase. And I remember uh, Commissioner Zuckerman at the time was on the B&T committee and I was the vice president of operations and I was reporting out, you know, seeing these collisions, you know, going up and up and up. And I remember uh, July of 2017, we started to, to change that. We saw the momentum go going the other way. And through the improvements of open road tolling, uh, through uh, engineering projects, uh, through, through management of our traffic trends, uh, through enforcement, we continued the downward trend. And I think what's most significant is yes, in 2020, we had reduced traffic. Reduced traffic equaled less accidents. But as the traffic went up through 21 and then through 22, we're almost matching 2019 pre-pandemic numbers, our accidents are still very low. So at 3.97% uh, collisions per million vehicles, if you look at the total numbers, it's, it's half of where we were in 2017. So that's a testament to the work out there in the field by our boots on the ground and also our management teams as well as our C&D partners in, in making the facilities as safe as possible. Again, more on that in February. Uh, in recent news, I want to recognize B&T's operations, tolling, maintenance, and security teams for an outstanding enforcement operation earlier this month. This is almost is my driveway as I have three teenage drivers, but it's not quite. Uh, 
if you look at this photo, uh, some of you may have seen media coverage by multiple outlets regarding a record-breaking 24 hours in which our officers stopped the vehicles of 29 persistent toll violators, or PTVs as we like to call them. 21 of those occurring at the Verrazano Narrows Bridge alone, that's where this picture was taken. These violators owed nearly half a million dollars in tolls and fees and were driving with suspended registrations due to toll violations. We looked at the metrics and we put our people in position and this is what we got. Great work, thank you. Great work by all and thanks to the MTA press office for highlighting these efforts. Because highlighting the efforts is also part of this layered approach to try to deter uh, toll evasion. So if there's no questions, I'll go into the report on operations. So the report on operations, uh, which can be found in this month's committee book on page 16. For November 2022, B&T continued to experience strong traffic counts that closely resembled pre-pandemic levels as we progressed through Thanksgiving weekend and into the winter holiday season. Paid vehicle traffic for November 2022 was 26.9 million vehicles, an increase of 0.3% over 26.8 million vehicles in November of 2021. When compared to pre-pandemic month of November 2019, November 22 was nearly equivalent. For December 2022, preliminary B&T traffic was 4% higher than December of 21. Also, preliminary traffic for December 22 was 0.4% higher when compared to pre-pandemic traffic in December, December of 2019. If there are no reports on operations, I will now go into the safety report, which, could be, which is found on page 28 of the committee book. Okay. B&T's November 2022 collision rate, as you saw on the chart uh, a couple of minutes ago, was 3.94 per million vehicles, which is lower than both the two-year baseline average of 5.16 and the prior rolling years of 2019 and 2020. And it also should be noted that that represents the lowest sustained trend going back to 2015. The collisions with injury rate was 0.82 per million vehicles, which means less than one collision with an injury per million crossings. Employee safety metrics over 12-month periods are as follows. The employee loss time injury rate was 5.5 incidents per 200,000 work hours, lower than both last year and the rolling year of 2019-2020. That concludes the safety report. If no questions, uh, there are no procurements this month, and that concludes the B&T report. Commissioner Mack. Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, also, I can say that that uh, enforcement of the uh, fake and fraudulent license uh, is very important. It's been on TV all week, uh, all over the country, <laughs> by the way. Uh, I saw it. Uh, I was out of state. Uh, and Danny, thank you. And uh, I want to be a little premature, but uh, we're going, Danny is retiring, and we're going to lose a really dedicated, hardworking, uh, and I looked to Jano to make the right choice in picking his successor. Thank you, Danny, for all your work. I'm a little ahead of time. Yeah, thank you. You still stuck with me for a little while, but thank you. Well, um, Commissioner Mack is Commissioner Mack is correct that uh, that it's a, there are big shoes to fill because it, it has been an extraordinary uh, record of accomplishment. And Commissioner Mack is also right that the MTA has led the way to raising consciousness uh, nationally, regionally, and nationally about uh, toll evasion, about this you know, problem which is growing and growing and I just a tip of the hat to Commissioner Jones who's been talking about um, a more equal equity oriented approach to enforcement on issues of fair and toll evasion. This is a big element of that of, 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 of a significant move the MTA has taken in that direction and you led the way. So um, and all the other regional agencies have uh, very much cooperated with you and executed alongside you. I note especially the city's commitment and the sheriff uh, of the city of New York as well. But you really did lead the way in orchestrating uh, a greater public profile for this issue, making sure people understood it. So well done. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion? <coughs> uh, 
to adjourn uh, committee. You've got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Mack. Thank you, uh, President Di Crescenzo. Let's hear from the Joint Railroad Committee, chaired by Blanca Lopez. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have three items for today's agenda that we would like to share with you. The first one will be the president's update, and then two committee actions, the approval of the 2023 work plan, as well as the meeting minutes from December 19th. Um, without further ado, I will transfer this to President Rinaldi for her report. Thank you, Board Member Lopez, and good morning, everybody. Grand Central Madison received customers for the very first time last Wednesday, January 25th, when shuttle service from Jamaica kicked off with the 10.45 a.m. Grand Central direct train from Jamaica, which represented the first extension of Long Island Railroad service since our first train to Penn Station in 1910. At around 11.07 a.m., right on time, those first customers detrained at their new terminal, golden tickets in hand, as they took in Grand Central Madison. Now that Grand Central Madison is actually open for business, I want to once again thank each and every person, past and present, who had a hand in bringing it to life. I can't tell you how many retirees I've heard from over the course of the last week who are just thrilled to see it finally open. I want to give a special shout out to all of the Long Island Railroad departments who have been working so hard for so long to get the railroad ready for this major milestone in LIRR history. Vinny is here sitting here representing the Long Island Railroad representative workforce. Thanks to the representative workforce for bringing it for every day for 15 years to get us where we are today. And our managers have been just killing themselves over the course of the last couple of months, led by our SVP of operations, Rob Pree, who's here. Uh, it's been a real, real team effort, and I'm so grateful for all the hard work that went into this magnificent project. Thank you all. Uh, it was a wonderful partnership with the CND team led by Jamie, led by Rob. Again, my thanks to, led by Jenna before that. Uh, so thanks to everyone for bringing this transformational new service to our customers. For at least three weeks prior to the start of full service, we're going to continue to operate the limited Grand Central direct shuttle service between Jamaica and Grand Central. Those trains will operate weekdays between 6.15 a.m. and 8 p.m. and from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. on weekends. They're running, they're running roughly once per hour during the a.m. and p.m. peak and roughly every 30 minutes in both directions during weekday, midday periods and on the weekends. We have customer ambassadors at Jamaica and on the Grand Central Madison concourse to greet customers, help them with wayfinding, answer any questions that they might have about this new space. Uh, Long Island Railroad customers heading to GCM are able to use Penn Station tickets for the Grand Central Direct Service since Penn and GCM are in the same fare zone. The special Grand Central Direct Service will conclude with the initiation of full train service mirroring what was previewed in draft schedules that were published over the summer. These new schedules represent a 41% give or take overall service increase, and we will be letting our customers know when they're set to go into effect. The new schedules will be available both on our website and the new Train Time app. So I ask all of you, if you haven't been there yet, come see what all the buzz is about and keep an eye out for the forthcoming combo ticket, which Jana alluded to at the top of the meeting. Switching to my other railroad, on January 10th, it was a thrill and an honor to celebrate 40 years of Metro North in Grand Central's Vanderbilt Hall in the presence of employees past and present, including four of our first five presidents. So you get to see them sitting there. Um, Peter Stengel, uh, Don Nelson, uh, Howard Permit, and Joe Giletti, in addition to myself. It was a really great morning. The anniversary gathering featured a retrospective of our rich and colorful history from a system comprised of antiquated parts that we inherited from Conrail in 1983 to the dynamic and proud service organization Metro North is today. Each of my predecessors navigated the challenges of their time with a distinct vision for the railroad and how to maximize the use of capital program funds to build and then set up the system for continued and sustained success. Metro North employees kept, helped kept the region moving during the pandemic, and it's because of them that Metro North ridership continues to steadily return and why Metro North's best days lie ahead. While we're on the topic of ridership, um, of course, we'd love nothing more than to wave a magic wand and have ridership revert back to where it was before the pandemic, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Talking first about Long Island, total Long Island ridership for 2022 came in at 52.5 million customers, which is 50.1% higher than the 21, 2021 total, excuse me, of 35 million and 57.6% of 2019's year-end tally. 
2022 commuter right, commute, yes, 2022 commutation ridership increased 117% over 2021, outpacing non-commutation ridership, which rose 24% compared to 2021. Looking at December, Long Island Railroad's December average weekday ridership was down 3% compared to November of 2022, which can be attributed primarily to holiday season vacations. Average Saturday and Sunday ridership declined between 7 and 8% compared to November. But despite all this, the month still produced the fourth highest post-pandemic one-day ridership total on a Saturday and the seventh highest on a Sunday. Long Island Railroad ridership to New York City on New Year's Eve rose significantly from last year. And ridership to Elmont UBS Arena for Islander games has been increasing steadily with an average of 3,000 plus riders per game. Switching now to Metro North, in December, Metro North served 4.61 million customers, a ridership increase of 42% from last December and representing 62% of December 2019's ridership. Total ridership for 2022 on Metro North was 48.9 million. 58.8% higher than 2021's total, and 56.4% of 2019's total. Commutation was responsible for more than half of the overall growth in 2022. It rose 125.1% over 2021 levels, almost four times the 34.9% growth on the non-commutation side between 21 and 22. As on, bo on both railroads, the return to offices was a large region for the increases in commutation ridership. Both railroads restored peak fares in 2022 in March, along with the introduction of 20-trip peak tickets and discounted monthly fares. And the requirement of peak fares for peak travel made commutation tickets more attractive. One-way peak tickets still remain popular as well for those whose travel patterns don't feel, fit quite well with the monthlies or with the new 20-trip tickets. In the new format today, I'm going to be also giving the ops report, so we're going to do Long Island first. Starting with the Long Island Railroad, total 2022 Long Island Railroad on-time performance came in at 95.8%, which is just half a percentage point below 2021's record OTP of 96.3%, particularly remarkable given all the infrastructure work that was going on throughout the year across Long Island Railroad. On-time performance for the month of December was 95.5, which is above the goal of 94%. There were six incidents last month that resulted in 10 or more late canceled or terminated train. The most significant of those was a flooding condition at Long Beach on December 23rd, which caused 58 late trains and delayed our customers an average of 11 minutes. MDBF for the fleet was 291,693 miles in November, which exceeds the 190,000-mile target. Year-to-day performance also remains above target. For Metro North, Metro North finished 2022 with an above-goal total on-time performance of 97.1%, approaching but not quite reaching our all-time record of 97.88% from 2020. It marks the third consecutive year in which Metro North's annual OTP ended above 97%, which is a major accomplishment. December system-wide OTP was 97.5%, again exceeding the 94% goal. There were two major incidents that affected the on-time performance in the month of December. A December 19th local utility issue, an electrical fire at Mount Vernon East, which caused 67 delays, and a winter storm on December 23rd, which disrupted service across the operating territory and caused 83 delays. MDBF for the fleet was 287,188 miles in November, 64% against the 64% uh, above, excuse me, the 175,000 mile target. Year-to-date performance at the end of November was 33% above the 2022 MDBF goal. Please refer to your key performance metrics books for additional ridership and performance details, as well as this month's safety and PD reports. In my monthly president's message in that book, you'll find updates on Jamaica capacity improvements, as well as a nine-station LIRR ADA improvement bundle, which is about to begin work. You can also read about the new peak city ticket option, as well as GCT train shed and Park Avenue viaduct work, critical signal and communications upgrades in the Bronx, and our latest Connect With Us customer outreach events. Normal committee reporting will resume in February, and that concludes my report. Yes, questions? Thank you, Blanca. Uh, w one question, Kathy. Uh, you've done a phenomenal job tracking and trying to get us back into business, uh, and COVID is uh, the latest curveball. 
I wonder, is it valuable and possible to track? We do weekday, we do weekend historically. Is it possible to start tracking a slightly different weekday that says there's a Monday, Friday data, and then there's a Tuesday, Thursday Yeah, we Thursday do that, data. actually. I can get you that. Well, I, it's not yeah. that I, I want it myself as a one-time. I actually think because that, that Monday, oh. Friday is such the obvious change in the behavior yeah. that that's sort of almost, in, not, I wouldn't say entrenched, but becoming established, mm -hmm. I should say. Uh, I see it on the train myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you see it in the subway, too. I wonder yep. if that's something we could make a slight modification to how we talk about it, because ultimately tracking Monday to Friday and what the moves are there feel like the only levers we have available to us to really continue to get back to, mm -hmm. uh, not, not that we can control it necessarily, we're takers, not makers, but maybe on the margin there's things we can do. So ha just thinking about how to track that and share it with us I think would be v valuable. Yeah, no question. We actually do look, I mean, you know, we've, we've talked about this, I think, on the committee before that, you know, we're getting to be for both railroads, sort of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday railroads. Those are our busy days, and Mondays and Fridays look quite different. Uh, so we can definitely slice and dice that data at the committee meetings and get you, you know, sort of trending and how that looks. No question. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Brickman? I don't know if I'm having a senior moment. Did, did we approve the uh, work plan in the minutes? Not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know we're moving right along, so I just. Yes, Mr. Poor. Yes, I had a question for you, Kathy. Uh, when you report on those numbers for Metro North, they include West of Hudson service? No, this is just the East of Hudson service. I'll get you the West of Hudson service. Separately. Okay, could you report to us on West of Hudson service, you know, and occasionally? And yeah, yeah, no, we, we have uh, in the new format, it, it's been a little bit different, but we will definitely get you that information. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions for President can, Rinaldi? Can I just offer yep. one, one uh, uh, peanut gallery comment, which is when Kathy says it's the second best on-time performance for both railroads, the first was when no one was riding during COVID. <laughs> so this is for real the best on-time performance, both railroads in 2022 in, in real world conditions that we have ever had. And Kathy did it while she was responsible for both. So just an acknowledgement of that. Well, I love to take credit for this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, you've got Justin here, you've got Rob here. They lead incredible teams who really, you know, deliver exemplary performance and safe performance every single day. So thanks to them and their teams. To you, Blanca. Um, we can move along now to the acceptance of the meeting minutes for December 19th. May I have a motion in a second? Motion, Mr. Brigman. Mr. Fleischer, second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Meeting uh, minutes approved. And then the other item is the 2023 work plan. Before we take a motion, President Rinaldi, is there any updates or any changes that you would like to talk? No, there are no changes to the work plan. Perfect. May I have a motion in a second? Thank you, Mr. Zuckerman, Mr. Brigman. Any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 2023 work, uh, work plan approved. Uh, with that said, unless there are any other comments or questions, I would like to have a motion to close this meeting. Thank you, thank you. Uh, meeting, uh, committee meeting is now closed. I now hand it over to Chair Mahatsis for the uh, New York City Transit meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Blanca. Good morning, I'd like to begin the New York City transit portion of today's meeting. Let's get started with committee business. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the December 2022 meeting. Motion, Andy, Liz, second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye, per motion passed. Okay, thank you. Let's move to the 2023 committee work plan. Rich, are there any changes to the 2022 work plan for 2023? Chair, there are no substantive changes to the work plan for 2023. We are finalizing a reformatted uh, work plan while maintaining the existing agenda items from month to month. We'll provide that updated format uh, next month, but again, no substantive changes to the plan. Okay, so we'll review it in February of 2023. Um, let's start with the President's report, Rich. Great, thank you. Before I get to the President's report, just a little business to conduct. Um, which is a reminder to this committee and to the public that the MTA and the New York City Transit Authority recently entered into a proposed settlement agreement that would resolve two class action lawsuits relating to the accessibility of the subways for those with mobility disabilities. If approved by the court, the MTA will add elevators or ramps to stations subject to the terms and conditions of the settlement agreement so that by 2055, at least 95% of the MTA's inaccessible stations, as identified in the settlement agreement, will provide stair-free paths to travel. Information about the terms of the settlement agreement 
and related court hearings can be found on our website at uh, new.mta.info backslash accessibility backslash ADA settlement notice. On to the year in review for New York City Transit. Um, you know, as mentioned before to this committee, we're focused very much on improving customer satisfaction, getting at least seven out of 10 of our customers satisfied or very satisfied by June of next year. As you can see, we've made progress in the six months that we've uh, articulated that goal. Uh, subways has improved almost 5%. Uh, buses stable, slightly down, but uh, opportunities to, to get us to 70%. And as you can see, notwithstanding some of the challenges mentioned earlier, which we will uh, talk to those customers about on some paratransit issues, um, in December, 70, almost 75% of our paratransit customers said they were satisfied or very satisfied with their service. Again, long way to go in all categories, but really trending in good news. As you know, we talked about faster, cleaner, safer, and I want to give you an update as to what we did uh, in these areas uh, in 2022. Uh, first, for faster service, um, as you see, as you know, we hired over a thousand train operators, conductors, improved weekend service uh, by delivering more trips. Uh, our speed program continues to deliver um, outstanding opportunities to improve uh, operating speeds. And we introduced new weekday schedules on eight lines this year that reduced running times uh, by 8%. So in fact, we're making it even harder on ourselves to deliver on time performance because our schedules are tighter. On bus, 1,800 new bus operators were hired and are out. We continue to maintain speeds at at least 2% above 2019 through the year. Our priority corridors, which is, shows you why bus lanes are so important, are showing above average speeds around 13%. We have 300 new ABLE cameras throughout the system. That's our automated uh, bus lane enforcement, uh, which is showing improvements uh, uh, for speed there. And obviously our Bronx redesign, which we briefed the board and committee on uh, multiple times, is showing improvement at about 7% speed improvements versus the rest of the boroughs. And then for accessibility for our uh, Accessor Ride, uh, broker service has now 8,000 drivers. We've often talked about supply and demand. Our paratransit service now has close to 100% pre-COVID ridership back. And so making sure that we have enough drivers uh, and folks to deliver the service um, has been key. You can also see the vacancy rate for our primary carriers has reduced uh, dramatically as well. And on-time performance uh, for Accessor Ride has improved dramatically over the last 12 months, going from 84% to 92%, uh, and for our primary carrier from 94% to 96%. Again, admitting we still have work to do, and for our customers who may have had a particular a poor experience, we need to work on that, but overall, things are moving in the right direction. For cleaner stations and vehicles, our crews have already uh, uh, completed 13 renovations. I think you probably remember we, well, I initially called it my, my stop. I think smarter people decided renovation was a better way to describe and market what we're doing. But our crews have been out there at 13 stations. Uh, our goal is to achieve 50 stations this year, basically one a weekend. We're converting to 800 new in-station cleaner and car uh, cleaner pos positions. I continue to hear from the public that when they get on a wet floor on the subway cars, they say, we know it's not a coffee stain anymore, we know it's a mop stain, that your crews are out there at the end of lines cleaning up on a regular basis, which we appreciate. And you know, Small But Big was reopening 18 public bathrooms uh, earlier this month, um, and so far so good. Uh, we're, as we mentioned, we'll pilot that and see if that works uh, well, but so far uh, so good. And on the bus side, you know, while our customers indicated they were generally satisfied with onboard cleanliness, Frank and Acaro and team have been piloting a new improved frequency uh, to do a deep dive cleaning of our, um, of our buses. We have successfully piloted that in the Bronx, and we'll be looking to bring that to the other boroughs later this year. For safer environment, I know that uh, Chief Kemper was uh, on his way or attempting, but we are so ahead of schedule, um, I don't know if he'll be able to join us. I'll, I'll talk as long as I can, Chair, and see if I can uh, stretch it out. Um, but I mean, really good news um, on this front. First, let me, let me just, ah, right on, look at that. I mean, that is, uh, Chief Kemper's on-time performance is 100% this year. I want to congratulate him uh, for that. 
Uh, Chief, good to see you. No, he's right here. He's fine. He's right there. Um, not to steal the Chief's thunder, um, but uh, momentarily he'll give his remarks. Um, uh, first, a couple things. Number one, the governor, the mayor, the chief, uh, Chair Lieber, on Friday uh, had a press conference to report our progress on subway crime and crime across our system generally. I know the chief will get into more uh, details there. But I think a couple things I'd want to mention. One is that from our pulse surveys that we uh, provide on a monthly basis, you know, customer perceptions of safety and security continued to increase. In December, 18% of our customers reported feeling safer than they did in November. And this was the largest increase since February. Again, the chief will get into sp the specific details in a few minutes, but I also want to uh, say welcome, and we appreciate his partnership already. Uh, the ability to work very closely with him and his team is paying dividends. On COPS, you know, camera and care, which has been one of the big uh, pushes, of course, uh, again, with the governor and mayor's leadership. Uh, we continue to push to install subway cameras on every subway car uh, by the end of 2024. Uh, we have continued to deploy our, our pilot of gate guards now in 17 stations in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx to defer uh, vending machine vandalism and to see additional uh, paid rides. We estimate, it's an estimate, uh, that their work is uh, seen an additional 1.7 million uh, paid rides since we started this back uh, in May. Uh, train conductors continue to make announcements when there's police officer presence in the stations on the platforms, both automated and otherwise. And as mentioned, our renovation uh, program, which is relamping our stations to make them brighter, safer, cleaner as well. Uh, on bus, our Vision Zero training, uh, combined with our customer service and de-escalation training for 5,000 operators, we've reinstituted our certified line training mentor program, all things that were paused due to manpower problems during COVID. Uh, we've completed over 2,000 check rides. These are literally our management team out uh, observing and providing feedback to our operators um, on their, on their uh, behavior and rides. Uh, 600 buses have been equipped with our pedestrian turn warning and we began a joint labor management assault committee to focus on bus operator protections. We've said it often, one assault is too many, but they continue on not only our bus operators, but our conductors, our station uh, uh, personnel and others. So working closely with labor to see what we can do to eliminate these and obviously working with the chief and his team to investigate these when they occur. On better weekend service, you know, we appointed, as you know, a weekend czar to oversee uh, customer operations. We've had an enhanced management and supervision. Uh, weekend on-time performance has increased from 76% to 82%. And I will let the cat out of the bag. This month, it is almost 88% on-time performance, which would be the best on-time performance for a month on the weekends in 10 years. So congratulations to Jose LaSalle and the entire operations team for putting out excellent weekend service. On bus, we continue to look at uh, management uh, focus to improve those operations. Again, you can see that weekend service delivered has significantly improved and wait time improvements have also occurred on the weekends for bus. And for subway, excuse me, and lastly, for enhanced communication, um, obviously, you know, we uh, announced last month that station agents will be coming out of the booth uh, to perform in-person customer um, service. Uh, we have a public hearing uh, on February 1st, this Wednesday. So anytime there is a change at all, really, of um, booth agents, uh, it requires a public hearing. So that will happen on the 1st. We'll report back to the board at the end of February. And assuming all goes well, we'll be launching uh, the agents coming out of the booth sometime in early March. For bus, digital screens, uh, we, our canceled trip app continues to improve customer experience. And overall satisfaction with onboard announcements and staff helpness, helpfulness is hovering between 66 and 69%. And then lastly, for our Accessoride customers, again, the number of calls being answered has increased up to 95%, and the speed of which those calls are being answered is, is at about 74%. All in all, a really busy um, year uh, for, for New York City Transit. Um, I mentioned the on-time performance for Subway for the weekend. I also want to let the committee and board know that the on-time performance for weekday service in January will also hit a 10-year high as well this month at 80, over 85%. Uh, short of a couple months uh, when folks weren't riding the system at the darkest days of COVID, this would be the best on-time performance since April of 20, 
13. So again, a lot of good work by Demetrius and his team in subways. Um, lastly, Chair, if, you, if I may, um, I know there were some comments about the uh, Jamaica bus terminal that came up. Um, I'd ask uh, maybe Craig Cipriano to provide just a little context about the operating needs there that we've looked at, and then I just have one more comment before I turn it back to you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Rich. So a little bit of context. So we don't currently own the land of the Jamaica bus terminal. The owner has plans to redevelop that land. And it's unclear whether uh, buses is part of that redevelopment. The bus terminal lease expires this fall, which requires us to find a new location so that we have continuous service for our customers. Uh, also, due to the growth in downtown Jamaica, there was very limited supply of alternative locations when we went out there. The current terminal is approximately 50,000 square feet of uh, space that we need. And that's for both uh, MTA bus, New York City Transit bus, as well as uh, NICE bus in Long Island. Uh, so the location that was picked really was the only potential site that could accommodate this square footage. Uh, the alternative really would have been you know, on-street parking, which is uh, really not optimal for our customers in the operation. And I think lastly, just want to say that we work with the Greater uh, Jamaica Development uh, Corporation in finding this uh, new location where we'll be uh, uh, bringing our operation to uh, later this year. So I'm happy to take any questions if there are some. Any questions for Craig? If not, Craig, um, on behalf of the committee, I just want to thank you for, I think today is your last committee meeting and board meeting. Thank you for all your guidance and your help, personally to me, but to everyone here on the committee. We're going to miss you and wish you all the best in your uh, retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any questions for uh, Rich Davey? If not, oh, Frankie, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I have to comment that um, this weekend, uh, me and my husband rode the subway. We saw a significant uh, increase of ridership. We noticed it. It's, it's, it's evident. Um, the announcements made, uh, automatic or the ones that the conductors made, uh, in much, much better. It's incredible about you know where we can find help if needed, uh, information about how to connect. Um, so there are significant improvements in that area, so congratulations. Uh, I noticed that, for example, in the, um, the R train station uh, on Steinway Street, the new, uh, the kiosk that has been there closed for a long, long time reopened. It basically changed the entire uh, atmosphere at the station. Now people are stopping by, they are, there's more traffic, it feels um, completely different, which, is, which could be a station that could feel a little bit kind of like, you know, needs, it's sad without that kiosk. Is that a plan of many of these kiosks in different stations to be reopened? Because it also brings uh, different kind of traffic and more presence of people that will deter probably those crime of opportunity. So I think those are the real estate kiosks you're mentioning. I don't know if Mr. Florio is available to talk, but I know that uh, we're looking, to your point, to think about the station not only from a customer service perspective, but also from a retail perspective, David. Right. Uh, right now we're looking to reopen a lot of the spaces that were closed because of the pandemic. It's very difficult as ridership stays low. Unlike the commuter rails at Grand Central, the retail and the subway is wholly dependent upon ridership because they're in the fare zone, right? So it's been very challenging for us to reopen. We're up to 50, we're, we're up to 62, and now we're down to 58 uh, open. So we're we're trying to push, and the rent is very, you know, is very low right now. We're keeping a low pursuant to the abatement, and uh, when we RFP new opportunities, we let the market speak. We don't set a rate. So sometimes it's just percentage rent. So we're making trying to be very flexible to let customer amenities back into the system. Agree, agree. But I think. Mr. Miranda's comment is well taken. Look, this is not how we're going to balance the budget, needless to say. But we should get those those newsstands and kiosks open with whatever uh, whatever operation can be made economical as quickly as possible. I think your your point is well taken. One of the challenges that we face, so everybody knows this, and sometimes it's overlooked, is most of those facilities don't have utilities. So while the newsstand folks 
always made good with just basically lights and nothing else. You know, you want to put a coffee stand in there, you want to do something that we all think of as a different kind of retail. Sometimes it involves significant investment. That's part of the challenge. But your point is well taken, and Mr. Florio is grinding away at that. Any other questions for Rich? Okay, if not, Chief, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Sure, you want me to start? All right, so first of all, good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Lieber, President Davey, MTA Police Chief Muller, uh, and all members of the board. Thank you for having me here today. <clears throat> With me is Deputy Chief Norman Grandstaff, who's uh, right here. He's a newly assigned member of a new leadership team at the NYPD's Transit Bureau. Just this past Friday, three days ago, I joined Mayor Adams, Governor Hochul, and Chairman Lieber, amongst others, to update the public on safety in the subway system. In short, I stated that 2022 was a challenging year regarding crime in the subway system, particularly when compared to 2021, a year when transit, when the transit system faced pandemic-related complexities, such as re reduced ridership and lower use. During the first 10 months of calendar year 2022, overall major crime in the subway system was up by a very concerning 41.6%. Then in late October, the mayor and the governor launched the COPS, Cameras and Care program. This plan put upwards of 1,200 additional uniformed officers in the subway system every day, assigning them to patrol trains, platforms, mezzanines and turnstiles. And the results were swift and significant. Through the hard work of the men and women in the NYPD, the turnaround began immediately and continues to today. When we compare the period from the end of last October and beginning on October 25th to present, with the same three-month period a year ago, overall crime in the subway system is down double digits, including a 28% reduction in robberies. And when we compare this same three-month period to the same three-month period of prior years, we are currently at the second lowest overall crime level in the NYPD Comstead era, era, well over two decades. Only 2020, the height of the COVID pandemic, recorded a lower three month period that started on October 25th. Make no mistake about it, none of this happened by accident. NYPD officers have worked long hours and very hard over the past three months to accomplish these results. And in addition to an increased uniform police presence in the subway system, enforcement in the subway system is up. Arrests are up in the most recent three-month period, 63%, including a 26% increase in felonies and a 78% increase in misdemeanor arrests. Enforcement focus on, focusing on quality of life offenses and fare evasion have increased dramatically. Also encouraging is our current year, January 2023 crime numbers, with overall major crime in the subway system being down 31% versus last January, and with arrests, tab summonses, and criminal court summonses all being up. A very good start to the new year. It should be noted that many of the summonses that we are issuing are for quality of life offenses, smoking, public urination, disorderly conduct, and other visible and disruptive acts, violations that any rider, rider would welcome an officer's intervention. Also encouraging is the results of the MTA's most recent Pulse survey, where queried ridership stated they feel safer and are more satisfied with the number of cops they see assigned to the subway system versus prior months. Riders rightfully deserve a subway journey where they are not subjected to displays of lawlessness or disorder, both at the turnstiles and beyond. They should not be afraid to use the subway system as a mode of travel. We are working hard and we are making progress, and our engagements are up across the board to accomplish this. Also, as I mentioned at last month's meeting, cops in the subway system do so much more than just fighting crime. They help people and they save people. Their bravery is commendable. Whether jumping on train tracks to save people, to saving overdose victims, to rendering aid to people in need, or just offering someone a level of comfort and safety by just their visible presence, your cops are focused, well-trained, and well-prepared to handle any challenge that comes their way. Let me say this, by no, mean, by no means are we claiming victory. We recognize we have a lot of work to do to get to where we want to be. There will be many challenges that lie ahead of us. 
But at the same time, we are extremely encouraged by the most recent data, and we are very proud of the hard work of the men and women of the NYPD. This commitment and this hard work will continue. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize and thank the MTA for their continued support. This is a team effort, and we appreciate the MTA's partnership greatly. We must also credit all of the MTA employees, especially your train conductors, who are diligent in announcing our office's presence on the platforms. This goes a long way toward crime deterrence and increased perception. And lastly, with Grand Central Madison's opening, it's an exciting time for mass transit in New York City. Congratulations to the MTA for delivering on a decades-long decades vision of east side access for ridership, a remarkable achievement. With that, I thank you for having me here today and for your time, and I welcome any comments or questions you may have for me. Any questions for the chief? Yes. Yeah, I, I read a news report or saw a news report that said or suggested that the state government was paying for NYPD cops to be in the MTA system. Is that true? And how much money is it and for how long a period of time? So I would refer you to uh, uh, the NYPD, uh, DCPI, to answer that question. I, I, I'm here to talk about uh, crime. Uh, Maybe and, Kevin uh, might know. I, 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 don't have that da I don't have that data here. I nor think, I think yeah. what, 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 what it's happened, I, okay. I, just, I, I think what happened was at the time that the, that the governor and the mayor took action in late October, there was uh, a, dis a discussion and an understanding about sharing of cost. The specifics are still being worked out together, taking account of the level of overtime and the, and the people power that's been put into this so far. So those discussions are underway by the, by the budgeteers. But yes, there was a discussion about uh, sharing of cost between city and state of some of the incremental cost of, of the surge that took place starting in late October. Is the surge still on? It is. Yes. Is it that, Mr. Solomon, did I accurately characterize that? Yes, Chair, you did. And, and you know, uh, the incremental cost that the Chair is referring to on top of, I believe, what is about a $250 million cost, uh, which is the cost for the NYPD Transit Bureau. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Jones. Yeah, uh, I'm sort of a one note. One trick person. I'd like to get the demographics of Tab Summons's. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'd like to get the demographics, racial age demographics, for Tab Summons's for fair evasion. I, I, I don't have demographic uh, inf information in front of me. I, I have total numbers, uh, I have percentage yeah, I, increase. It's something, actually, it's been mandated by the city council. It's not only me that we need to know this to make sure we're getting equitable enforcement. This is nothing to say how valuable your people are in terms of their work. But there has been a history of over-enforcement on very poor neighborhoods versus more advantaged neighborhoods. And it's something that I've been concerned about, obviously, particularly with other neighborhoods uh, having no enforcement, and not your fault, because it's on buses, but there's lots of fair evasion going there, but no enforcement at all. So this is an equitable issue that I just need to have the demographics. When I was told six years ago that 95% of the um, uh, tab summonses and arrests for fair evasion were black and brown, and virtually none for other communities, I was concerned, and I remain concerned. So I do need that data, not as a criticism to, of your work, but something we need to know. Understood. And, and uh, I, listen, I, I could speak on deployment uh, and, and how we deploy, uh, which is critical if we are going to have success. Um, we got to get that right. Uh, our deployment is based on crime, where the crime's occurring, uh, during the uh, hours that they're occurring, the locations in the subway system where they're occurring, whether they occur on a train, the platform, mezzanine area. Again, critically important. We follow crime. We're hyper-focused on crime crime reduction uh, and, and deployment. That's what dictates uh, our, our, our presence. Uh, amongst high ridership locations, quality of life complaints, uh, and complaints from the commun community, uh, but that's how we deploy. Any other questions for the chief? 
Chief. Thank you. I'm looking forward to working, continue the good work that we're doing. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, now we have transit procurements. Rich? No procurements this month. Okay. I, if there are no procurements, I think we're done with business. I'll take a motion to adjourn the January Joint Committee meeting. Second from David. Right. Thank you, all those in favor. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, the, we're, this is a um, historic moment. <laughs> the MTA board meeting is close to a, an hour ahead of schedule. Um, and if we just hang out for a couple minutes, one of the ways we would try to preserve, we, we made, you know, public comment you know, notice about when public comments would be taken, we have to maintain and we should maintain. Uh, so what we're going to do is to, in a few minutes, to um, move up a presentation that was going to take place during the body of the board meeting, which is on the, the results of the capital program in 2022, to this portion of the meeting. Then we'll take a break and we'll, we'll return uh, for the, uh, the formal board meeting when we, uh, at the same time, we'll hear public comments. Okay? So let's just hang loose for a few minutes while um, our team is uh, scrambling to, to, to get together a presentation that was meant to be given two hours from now. Okay, thank you. I think there's a presentation, Jamie. Good morning, members of the board. Um, we, uh, we, we wanted to give you a, a year in review presentation uh, as we do each January, um, as, we, uh, as we look back at the year that we had in uh, construction and development. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to do that. Of course, I was mentioning earlier we had a banner month at uh, C and D. We all, we really had a banner year. Um, you can see some of the historic occasions that were recognized and acknowledged. We talked about opening Grand Central Madison um, after after all of that time working on that critical project. We also completed Third Track, uh, the uh, the. Um, uh, capacity improvement for uh, 10 miles of the main line on Long Island and reconstruction of all the affiliated infrastructure. I talked already about the recognition we gave for uh, the Penn Gateway entrance and concourse. Um, and uh, we have also completed many important state of good repair and system enhancement projects. Um, but also, perhaps more importantly, we also advanced much of our planning and institution building work at CND, and I wanted to give you an update on that. Rather than run you through what would be a very lengthy uh, PowerPoint presentation of all the ribbon cuttings and groundbreakings that we did last year, we wanted to take a step back to review the year as it relates to our strategic mission as an agency and what it means for the years to come. In a report we'll release in the next few days, we are going to detail uh, our strategic plan for MTA construction and development moving forward. Uh, three big objectives for CND that we have here, execute the program, plan for the future, and build the organization. Wanted to give you a few highlights of each of those major strategies that we're undertaking. Essential to the work of CND is the question of how we deliver capital work at scale. Uh, we have a $55 billion capital program it's 70% larger than the prior capital program. We expect to continue maintaining that level of investment. As we've discussed many times at this board, we have a trillion dollar asset here um, and an investment in state of good repair and enhancement to that asset that's necessary to serve our riders requires that we maintain a significant capital program at that scale um, because of its size, age, and complexity. We need a massive infusion of investment to keep it running and meet new demands. This was, of course, a major reason why CND was created, to pool resources from across the entire program to help us deliver more. So how have we been able to scale the work up? 
Bundling allows us to take advantage of economies of scale and geography by putting strong project managers in charge of larger groups of projects of similar types or in similar or proximate locations. We can reduce overall costs, minimize disruption to customers, and crucially, build our capacity to get more work done. To give you an example, in 2018, work on station improvements was scattered across 20 contracts. In 2023, we'll do twice as much station works, but just nine contracts will comprise 90% of that work. So from 20 contracts to nine contracts with an increase in the amount of work that we're doing. This is massive progress on the ADA program that would not be possible without bundling. Using the right delivery model, as we state here, is also essential. Design build lets us move faster while assigning the risk to the party best equipped to deal with it. We've certainly seen successes on third track and other projects for design build. In 2022, we also used our first public-private partnership on yet another uh, ADA accessibility bundle, taking this concept even further to leverage private financing to further incentivize speedy and quality project delivery and maintenance as well for those assets. In 2023, we're looking at using a progressive design build, which is another new delivery model that we believe has the potential to help us to prioritize the most important capital repairs across our system. So here's the, the news and the summary from last year. Uh, we achieved $11.4 billion in commitments. So out of that $55 billion program last year, uh, you can see that those were commitments across the program. And um, just as much as, uh, and, and I want to say that over 90% of those commitments were within the core infrastructure program. So you can see that uh, about a billion dollars of commitments were made in the integrated projects, the integrated mega projects, the rest, 90% was the core infrastructure program. And we heard concerns last year about whether C&D has the capacity to deliver on the $55 billion capital program. You can see from the ramp up on the left that we can do so, and we're very proud of the team that brought this all in. We similarly saw a ramp up in completions exceeding last year by more than 50%. We completed $6.2 billion worth of capital work last year. This to me is just as important, if not more important than demonstrating that we're initiating projects through awarding contracts. We are actually getting the work done on time and on budget or under budget in a lot of cases. And I do wanna note that this is despite not rushing projects to substantial completion until we're satisfied with the result. For projects like Queens Boulevard West, CBTC signal modernization, and of course, Grand Central Madison. We have held contractors' feet to the fire and where necessary, withheld or, or avoided that substantial completion until we knew that the project was ready. So we're completing projects, but we're also using all the tools that we have to get them done and to incentivize contractors to get work done. It's not just about getting projects out the door or completing them. Containing cost is also essential. As I presented to the board uh, in December, we have a range of cost containment measures being implemented at CND, and we're taking on more this year. This year, a strategic focus being led by uh, Tim Mulligan, um, uh, Deputy Chief Development Officer at CND, is managing force account costs and very much doing so in partnership with uh, New York City Transit. It's a, a topic of uh, frequent discussion between uh, Rich and myself and, and many folks across the two agencies. So we'll be partnering together to plan outages and we'll implement better tools to estimate, manage, and monitor force account. And of course, we do so acknowledging the, the goals to improve service and satisfaction with service um, at New York City Transit um, that I know you heard about this morning. Um, it's just as critical that we make sure we have the outages available and the support available so we can get work done efficiently um, without really uh, diminishing service. Uh, it's a very difficult balance, but one that we're carefully managing together, and we expect to make a lot of progress on that this year. In 2022, we saw results from cost containment. Even in an inflationary market, we saw our design build projects come in 6% below our engineering estimate, the estimate we put together in advance of soliciting bids for a project. That's nearly quarter of a billion, a quarter of a billion dollars in savings from that 6% uh, lower um, uh, final proposals. 
for A plus B contracts, which is our design bid build contracts where we incentivize timely completion, it was an even greater 9% savings rate, which is, as you can see here, worth more than $100 million. We also saw progress on program-wide budget categories like force account, and that's even before we put this added strategic focus on that for the coming year. And as I've reported to the board before, the placement of our owner-controlled insurance policy, which saved us compared to where the market is trending between 60 and $95 million. So since time is money, we're also pleased to see time savings as well, four months and five months on average for design build and A plus B contracts respectively uh, compared to the estimate that we had going in. Just as important is that we take on the most important projects and that we organize to do them right. By empowering our project executives, we centralize accountability and give our best leaders the space that they need to lead. This is true for entire programs. For example, CBTC, signal modernization, where we've brought in great minds to comprehensively reconfigure our signal modernization program as a technology program. We'll see the fruits of that starting with the Crosstown G-Line signal modernization project, um, uh, which we awarded last year. This year, we're taking a similar look at another technology-heavy project in the rollout of Omni, working with our agency partners to apply lessons learned uh, to ensure that it uh, gets back on track or stays on track for uh, completion and making sure that it serves the needs of all of our operating agencies. So more to come. Uh, we'll be back to the board with um, some of the results of the review we're conducting of Omni in the next few months. It's not just today's biggest issues that we're taking on. We're tackling the needs of tomorrow through long-term planning that will help us stay ahead of the curve. This will be a big year for planning at the MTA and at CND in particular. It includes our 20-year needs assessment, which will be the first done under one unified agency by CND. It will take into account the changing needs of our aging system and put forward strategies for us to meet them. It will also take a comparative evaluation of potential expansion and enhancement projects, such as Interborough Express, to help us meet changing demand from across the region and address equity goals for the agency. So the comparative evaluation, which will have some preliminary results from this spring, uh, feeds into our 20-year needs assessment, which we'll be bringing to the board in October of this year. And all of that takes us to the next five-year capital program next year. Um, this is a, it's, we have a great team working on this and they're doing it in an extremely rigorous way, but one that's also responsive. I know board members have reached out uh, to ensure that we're considering one project or another, the condition of a station or the condition of a line. We've been able to be responsive, but also we're putting everything on a level analytic playing field. Um, and I think we'll really see the results of that. Of course, as I mentioned, Interboro Express is one example of a comparative evaluation project that's under consideration. We'll also take on uh, the most pressing of future needs with a climate action plan this year that's integrated into our capital planning. It'll help us comply with Governor Hochul's Executive Order 22, which sets the state on a path to a much more sustainable future. So more on that to come in the coming months. Of course, we're still a very young organization at CND. Although we were founded in 2019, in a way, 2022 was our first full year without COVID era budget conditions and restrictions. And so we need to continue to build up our own capacity to be able to grow and innovate and meet ever higher goals in the future. This is certainly a priority of mine uh, as the head of the agency. Um, we created, as we've described to the board before, this system of business units, um, taking leadership over projects. In the last year, we have added or we've consolidated a railroads business unit um, to work with both uh, railroads uh, to um, take advantage of best practices. We created a systems business unit that is technology implementation focused. Uh, we've created a new safety unit uh, that um, is uh, developing a set of best practices to ensure that we remain very safe as we do our work. And as I said, we've got strategic plans for the signals group. Um, we are looking at an expansion of us, our small business mentoring program uh, and are maintaining the outward service uh, from the external partners program, as well as spreading best practices across all of C&D through our delivery services office, which is doing a great job. I also <coughs> um, 
it may it may be a little inside baseball-y, but I, I wanted to say that we are also looking to uh, create a, a roadmap for the digital transformation at CND. Um, you know, capital program management, like every other sector uh, in the world, needs to upgrade in the way that it it uh, it manages itself and uses technology. In fact, there are studies that demonstrate that the construction sector has lost billions of dollars globally in productivity by not keeping up with changes in uh, in, in technology and particularly uh, uh, construction program management through digital means. And so we're uh, creating a digital roadmap at the same time that we're beginning to unify all of our policies and procedures, all of our data and all of our systems into one place um, without necessarily leaving behind all the legacy components that we have. So we expect to provide updates on that this year, but that's a major priority for us this year. Of course, none of this matters if we're not providing better service for customers as a result. And so this is some, some highlights on the projects that we um, have uh, completed in the last year and committed uh, for future construction. We were very pleased to open the Livonia and 170th Street ADA upgrades. Um, uh, we, of course, awarded 13 New York City transit stations, seven Long Island Railroad stations for ADA, system reliability, um, completed the capacity improvements at Jamaica, that phase one of improvements that are uh, aimed at reducing the infamous Jamaica crawl. Um, and I think that this is the phase that's been in support of Grand Central Madison opening and the transition of service there. But we have much more work to do and intend to do it over the next year. We've been upgrading substations and other infrastructure components in the system. I mentioned uh, uh, the signal modernization. We'll move forward with Crosstown ensuring the, the long-term sustainability of our assets, um, uh, the bridges certainly, and we released a plan uh, in the last few months uh, on um, uh, bicycle and pedestrian access across the system, including on uh, the bridges that we're able to provide access to. Um, another mega project really is the upgrading of the Park Avenue viaduct, which we awarded the first phase of last year, 98% of uh, Metro North trains uh, uh, traverse the Park Avenue viaduct, and so we're making sure that we maintain that uh, through capital replacement while uh, not disrupting the operations of the railroad. Um, we're overcoating uh, huge portions of our line structures, and then uh, very focused, as I said, on uh, the relationship of our assets to the climate. Um, we uh, opened the Clifton Maintenance Shop last year, uh, which was a Sandy-funded resiliency project that we uh, were able to partner with our federal, uh, our federal partners on. Uh, that's over $8 billion of Sandy work that we've uh, completed or have in the pipeline, including the resiliency of the uh, A train and the shuttle coming over um, uh, the Jamaica Bay. Uh, and reconstructing what's called the Hamels Y, which is the section of uh, that, that line uh, as we get over the, onto the Rockaway Peninsula. We awarded a project that was consolidated um, in a strategic way or bundled so that the work gets done efficiently at the end of last year. And of course, beginning that transition to uh, electric vehicles or zero emissions uh, bus fleet, um, with the Jamaica Bus Depot reconstruction. Uh, I, I know that um, uh, shortly, or he may have done it already, um, that w the, just to clarify, the Jamaica Bus Depot reconstruction is, the, the, is rebuilding that depot that exists, and it's not the Jamaica Bus Terminal that I think Rich already referred to in the committee, um, but this project is a critical environmental justice project um, supported by members of the community and elected officials because we're upgrading that depot, and we're moving towards zero emission vehicles, which certainly um, uh, you know, creates environmental justice benefits in Jamaica and beyond. Um, so that's our um, set of projects. And just you know, what we have uh, highlights we anticipate coming back to update the board on in 2023 in the major expansion mega projects, full service to Grand Central Madison uh, planned for um, next month. Um, uh, moving forward with uh, Metro North Penn Station access uh, in an accelerated way, as we described at the committee earlier, breaking ground on Second Avenue Subway Phase Two, uh, moving forward with the reconstruction of Penn Station, which we also talked about at length at the committee this morning, and launching the environmental review on the Interborough Express as part of our comparative evaluation and headed into our next capital program. We also expect to complete 13 new ADA subway stations 
award contracts for 17 more and go from the Crosstown CBTC to the next critical line, uh, the Fulton line on the A and the C, the A and the C uh, Fulton line. And then we have two new substations, rehabilitation of 11 more, and lots more infrastructure to be completed this year. So that that's some, thank you. I, that, I'll just, just wrap up to say that's uh, some of our highlights. We had a great 2022 and, and a plan for a very successful uh, 2023. Board Member Albert. Shouldn't, shouldn't that say initiate 8th Avenue CBTC, since I believe that's where the work has been done, not on Fulton Street yet? 8th Avenue is the, as you say, the work that's been done. Um, and so we expect to complete 8th Avenue CBTC. I'm actually not sure because uh, its interaction with Rolling Stock, if that's a 2023 completion target, this is a new project for the Fulton Line portion of the A and the C in Brooklyn. Yeah. Questions and comments? Mr. Bringerman. Yeah, Jamie, Jamie, do you anticipate doing any work with the uh, Port Authority in the next year or so? I know they had that whole grand scheme where they're going to access LaGuardia with another air train or whatever, and then that thing kind of fell apart, and we haven't heard anything since. Yes, that, that, that is um, it's something we're involved in. There is a review that the governor ordered a review of that project. Um, that review is still underway, so um, I'm not, I don't have an exact uh, date for when those results will be released. But our planning team has very much been a part of that. Um, and, uh, you know, we certainly support whatever solution allows for or enables, uh, uh, you know, greater access to the airports, which we know is a, that's certainly a Port Authority goal and priority and makes sense for them to be spearheading. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's just a, a stay tuned type of thing then. Okay. Mr. Solomon, then Ms. Velez, and Ms. And Mr. Zuckerman. Just want to commend um, Jamie and the whole team uh, for the vision going forward. Um, I'm always impressed with your cogent explanation of uh, difficult delivery methods, for example. And so for the board's benefit, um, you know, if you could just explain a little bit more detail the benefits of progressive design build. I mean, it's not a, a political, you know, ideology. Um, it's a certain... <laughs> It's a certain way to deliver projects where we uh, know that it can help the owner, it can help the overall project delivery. So uh, I, that's my first question. The second question on OSIP CSIP. Sure. Um, yeah, and and I agree uh, that we, you know, sometimes I think we we need to come up with a new name for that if we want to sort of, you know, gain support in certain circles for it. But the 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 notion is just, and and I will say that, um, and I know the chair um, shares this sentiment. Um, uh, probably more deeply than than I that um, you know it, this is this is a e each of these delivery methods is appropriate to a certain type of project to a certain set of risks and um, I don't think that progressive design build is the solution to every delivery problem and we, you and I have had a discussion about this at some length um, you know essentially what it's what we're doing is we're you know typically with design build we advance design to a certain stage and then we transfer the risk through a procurement to a design build firm <clears throat> that completes the design and is responsible for construction um, and that's been very successful 77 percent of our project awards in 2022 were design build and we expect to continue with that there may be certain projects where the level of unknowns at that stage of design is still considerable. Um, and so, you know, one example is what we're looking at for progressive design build is a package of horizontal improvements across the subway system um, where, you know, we don't have the ability to do enough surveys, to uh, gather enough data so that we're able to fully demonstrate what that risk is. So you simply advance design more. Um, and you do so, which means that the things you're uncovering the owner is taking that risk forward um, and eventually then uh, transfers it to the design builder. Um, it's got advantages, which means that, um, you know, up front we're able to, and, you know, particularly as the market tightens and a lot of infrastructure dollars get out there, it means we're able to attract more design builders to work for us. Um, it's got disadvantages, which is essentially that we're not transferring as much risk as we otherwise would like to do. Um, so we're looking at it really same way we did with the P3 in a pilot way on this uh, horizontal infrastructure contract that we expect to have out in the next few months, and we'll see how much success we have with that and, and where we need to go with it. As you can tell, as Jamie alluded to, I'm uh, uh, 
fairly cautious about the idea of um, diluting the sense of accountability and clarity that design build gives us. So, but I, I, Jamie has really very thought, as he explained to you, very thoughtfully advanced the idea of having a, a little more movement in the dial of risk transfer depending on the project. So that's what you're hearing. It's a, it's a, it is a sign of the sophistication that the team has achieved that we're now able to talk about really, you know, customizing the level of risk transfer in a project to the specific risks that each project has. We had Ms. Velez. Okay, you come, we'll come back on second round. Ms. Thank Velez. you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Jamie, for a phenomenal um, presentation. And I echo Commissioner Solomon's um, accolades that uh, the leadership shown through CND on our delivery methods has really borne fruit and will continue to bear fruit. Um, just in the lens of MWBE and SDVOB and DBE inclusion, we all know here around the table, and uh, it's no, no secret outside, that we are an industry leader na nationally and certainly within the state for, for inclusion. And as we, as we talk about bundling packages, making projects bigger, and we also talk about P3 and design build and progressive design build, Please let's keep our eye on the prize of ensuring that we have inclusion and equity in all of the contracts that we let. It, it, it gets a little more complicated as you chance for that risk over, uh, that things might get lost in the sauce. And this program is so key and central to the work that we do here, to our communities that we serve, and certainly being that national example. Thank you, uh, Board Member Velez, and I you know, appreciate your articulation of that and all your, your very public articulation of uh, the importance of this work. I, it, we are committed to that. Um, we're aware of the concern. I, I think um, there's a few things that really get us there. Um, you know, one of them is just that we set very ambitious goals and we hold our contractors to those goals, and we've seen that. I mean, we, you know, third track, major design build project, the first one out of the gate, we are achieving our MWBE goals, um, and uh, and you know, and doing so, um, you know, in a very transparent way that's very inclusive. Um, of course, we need more MWBE builders um, in the system, and so we are aggressively moving towards certifying new firms, um, and we're uh, entering into a renewed partnership with Empire State Development in order to do that. Um, because we haven't seen those certifications move quickly enough. Um, so we have to make sure the pool is available. I also am very focused on capacity building, um, along with, of course, my, my colleague Michael Garner at, at, uh, uh, at DDCR um, and others that work closely with him. Um, and, you know, capacity building really comes in the, the opportunities to prime contracts. So that's where we have our small business mentoring and development program. We're looking to raise the cap on the size of contract that is eligible for the small business program this year so that we can continue to build up that capacity to prime contracts that positions firms for larger jobs. And we've seen lots of success. We've seen, uh, I think the, the small business program uh, is now 13 years old, and we've seen a, a number of uh, MWBE firms that have taken on jobs outside of that program as primes. Uh, up to and including $25 million construction projects, which we'll, you know, we'll report on to the board in the future. So I got to, I see this is a moment to uh, acknowledge that C&D, you know, executes the contracts and enforces the MWB goals with the contractors, but um, the other big ingredient is DDCR, and Michael Garner is sitting there, and we have had, as Michael always reminds us, we've been an industry leader. Uh, we've been the state leader. We're about a third of the state MWBE achievements every year. We're uh, in excess of a billion dollars to that community. We are by far the biggest dog in the kennel. Um, so, Michael, stand up and take a bow. Uh, Ms. Vallette, uh, Ms. Lopez, and then uh, Mr. Zuckerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
thank you very much, Jamie, for a great presentation and for, I always learn a lot whenever I hear your presentation, especially in this area, so I appreciate that on a personal note. Um, I believe there is a either a public comment period or a public hearing next Tuesday on capital projects. Can you just tell me a little bit more about that, if that's okay? Um, we do an annual public hearing. Um, I might see if uh, Mr. Mulligan or anyone else would include any other details on that. Sure. As part of the uh, federal funding cycle for federal formula aid, um, really the, f the federal money to the capital plan comes in two flavors. There's formula aid that we get based on sort of, uh, you know, regular statutory statistics about our side and the number of riders that we have. And we have a lot of flexibility about which projects we apply to use that federal formula for. This hearing allows the public to hear the full uh, list of potentially federally eligible projects for the formula aid. Um, and that's part of the public process that the federal government goes through uh, before uh, accepting our applications for those formula grants and awarding spe specific federal funds for specific projects. So it's usually a broader group of eligible projects than we'll ultimately sort of will receive grant funding for. Um, but it's really an early stage of the 23 grant cycle. Those grants will be executed later in the fall, around the end of September or early October. And then we will, uh, you know, be in a position to award and commit those projects uh, to be de completed for design and mobilized and constructed in, in the coming years. Okay. Mr. Zuckerman, and then come back to Mr. Sol Solomon and Mr. Bringerman. Jamie, you started talking about the 20-year capital needs, and you mentioned board members have been coming with projects. Can you just remind us about the schedule for when we're going to have a more substantive conversation about that, and what's a mechanism instead of people like writing crib notes and putting it under your door? What's a more pro you know thoughtful and more transparent process for us to have that engagement with you? Sure. Um, so we have a planning team. It's a capital asset planning team. Um, that uh, that has been hard at work for some time on this. So the first piece of it is the comparative evaluation of really any potential sort of system expansion projects that we've heard. We've been to the board with that to, to describe what that list is. The analytical work is all happening on that. We expect to have some preliminary results on that in the spring, which we'll, we'll um, bring out publicly. And that takes us towards the publication of the 20-year needs assessment in October. So between now and then, um, we certainly welcome public comments on the needs. I have to say a lot of the needs are, you know, the sort of state of good repair. I mean, do, you know, how long will this substation last? What's the, you know, mean distance between failure for, you know, this, this train or that train or, you know, this escalator, this elevator. So we're doing that analytical work. We always welcome public comment uh, through the website, through the, you know, Twitter, through the various channels that people have to communicate to us about priority conditions. Uh, uh, and people aren't shy in this uh, system in this region in, in letting us know. So we're incorporating all of that and then finding ways to communicate it back in, in the public uh, in the fall of this year. May I suggest you recirculate the list of projects that are in the comparative evaluation process so that everybody knows what, you know, what the we'll universe do. is? We'll do. Because they ain't all going to get funded, but they're all going to be analyzed. And Mr. Brigham. Um, question on the um, uh, on the insurance savings that you noted before, Jamie, of about sixty to ninety million, I believe. I believe you um, you presented on that previously as a beneficial byproduct of the usage of OSIP CSIP. Um, and if you could just elaborate that. Uh, on that a little bit more, if it's because you have a better safety record, et cetera, and whether or not we favor OSIP more than CSIP. Sure. Um, so just for for, uh, for for board member reference, so the, those stand for owner-controlled and contractor-controlled insurance programs. Um, essentially, uh, if we don't have a sort of bundled insurance program through one of those two mechanisms, every member of a contracting team has to go and get their own insurance. And so, you know, there's a variety of problems with that. It certainly ends up costing more because we don't have the economies of scale. 
uh, in buying the insurance. It also is uh, is exclusionary for small businesses and uh, particularly MWBE businesses that are just unable to get those uh, those insurance policies. So the MTA has moved in every case that we can to OSIP or CSIP. Um, in general, uh, there's a set of decisions that we make about which one is more suitable to the project. Um, it's fair to assume that, this, that the OSIP, the owner-controlled program, because of our scale, gives us the greatest savings, but it's not necessarily on a risk-adjusted basis the way that we would go in each case. Um, but uh, we, and also, um, we are statutorily required to only use OSIP for uh, railroad and subway construction projects. We can't use it for, say, the Jamaica Bus Depot, which is a, you know, a new building. Um, so uh, although we're looking at whether we ought to have a, a sort of legislative exemption from that and be able to carry OSIP for other projects. Um, and then, as, as you said, board member, the, the, um, you know, it's not only that we saved money by using those two programs, which we do year in and year out. It's also that we, um, and actually the, you know, something that Jano started, um, we identified that the cost of OSIP had crept up over time, <clears throat> and we did some work to determine what was driving that and made some strategic decisions when we went back to do our OSIP placement for 2022. It was about, I think we placed it on about a billion dollars worth of projects. Um, and uh, we incentivized our brokers. We hired a new set of brokers. We incentivized our brokers to bring us in a uh, lower premium. Um, we also uh, have done a lot of work on safety within our system over the last few years, and just because C&D is a consolidated entity that is working effectively and efficiently, we were able to go and brief the insurance providers. We made presentations to them, and based on that, we were able to place the OSIP for the upcoming set of projects at uh, closer to a 5 or 6% of construction cost rate, whereas in previous years it had been in the order of 9 or 10%. Um, so that's what that 60 to $95 million is. What I hope w is um, is that we have a better handle on uh, on the relation, you know, our, 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 our what the expectations are for, you know, for contractors, right? That that there is a, a growth of confidence as a result of the way that the C and D is managing jobs uh, in the industry, so that the insurance industry is is a little more generous, I think, and competitive in, in how they're they're pricing some of this. Uh, we had Mr. Brink, um, first round, Mr. Borelli, yeah, and just, then- Just wanted to add, I think that was a great answer to the question, but the mo most important thing is that the agency, the MTA, controls the coverage that's being purchased, because many times exclusions are put on individual contractors' policies, and you'll have no way of knowing what they are unless you do a, a real deep dive. So having, the, the fact that we're saving money is, is the first important thing, but actually even more important is that the coverage is controlled by this agency. Thank you. But just as a contrary heads up for all of us, that the safety, we want to make sure that the contractors are properly motivated to, to, to run safe jobs. So in some cases, see, you know, adding the, uh, making them the purchasers of the insurance um, is the right thing to do. And we're, we're very carefully managing that balance. Um, Mr. Bringerman. Yeah, Jamie, can you explain how you came up with the solution for the infamous exhaust problem at Grand Central Madison? Um, I, <laughs> how much time do we have here? Also, I don't know if we, I don't know if we have, uh, Just the executive I don't know if we have summary. Mr. Troop here. <laughs> sure. Uh, it, you, I, I mean, um, I, I will say, and you know, Jana's very articulate on this, um, it w sort of, you know, what we, what we learned, um, is, you know, we had a number of intersecting issues. You know, there was the fact that this project really was because of its length and, you know, we've, we've been open about how long that it took a long time and, and until it was cleaned up in 2018, it was designed a long time ago. <clears throat> Things change in the way that air performs in buildings and facilities, uh, over periods of time, as well as technology. Um, the other thing um, that we intersected with was we were not only opening a brand new 700,000 square foot concourse, we were opening it inside another terminal that is 100 years old that has its own air flows and air performance issues. Um, so, you know, the, the station was fully built out and certainly safe, um, but 
in the last throws of it, we really had to demonstrate that the air could flow in the ways that it was designed to flow. Um, and the challenge at the end of December was that we were unable to do that because of the interaction between Grand Central Madison Concourse and the 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 uh, and Grand Central um, and the the concourse in Grand Central. Um, so uh, as as many people will note, there is a barrier that's been placed up uh, between the two terminals. Um, there's a vestibule. It's quite a you know it's 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 a it's a relatively nice place to walk through. We aren't frank. We've said that we're not that that pleased with it. Um, but I think riders are certainly enjoying the station a lot. Um, we're working on a permanent solution. And the question is whether the permanent solution will involve managing the airflow without having a barrier up or uh, placing up a much nicer barrier. Um, the kind that you see, basically a glassy barrier that um, you sort of don't notice when you're walking through. Um, so we'll have that solution in, in the next couple of months. No, I appreciate the answer because, you know, I just want everybody to know it wasn't quite a simple thing it is a it's very very complex and i mean when you're digging down on dot the seventh level of hell to build that <laughs> station i mean you were what 15 stories down and you're trying to exhaust Something up from like there that. so i mean yeah it's yeah. it's not an, it's not an easy yeah engineering feat and the key is as as uh, as kathy and rob free and and others will attest our focus is safety um so we had a number of intersecting different uh authorities having jurisdiction uh, that are regulators of our code compliance, um, a special inspector, our code unit, uh, Long Island Railroad's um, uh, authorities, um, our uh, general engineering consultant, um, and you know, just the making sure that everybody can get to a place where we're comfortable was the thing that, that really cost us the time. No, I've been there on, yeah. on a much smaller scale, but I've been there, so yeah. I know exactly what you were dealing with and appreciate all your work on that. Other questions for Jamie? Comments on the historic successes of the MTA Capital Program? Okay. With that, we're going to we're going to uh, uh, call a break. And Paige, why don't you explain the logistics because of our incredible uh, achievement of historic <laughs> early performance? Sure. So we're concluding the joint committee session now, and we will open the board meeting at twelve fifteen and start taking public speakers who are ready to speak. Public speakers can still sign up until 1225 as previously announced. So members of the public who scheduled uh, around that time will still have an opportunity to um, speak. So we'll reconvene at 1215. With that, I've got to do a motion to adjourn the, the uh, committee meetings. Lisa, Blanca, thank you. Uh, any opposition, we are adjourned.